this for us. And um, uh, just to remind people of the format. Um, so these are flash presentations. So they are limited to 10 minutes. Um, and I'm going to be timing them. And I'll be intervening when you go past 10 minutes. OK, so um, no pressure. Um, <laughs> so I'll be keeping an eye on things. This is so that we have plenty of time for discussion, which is the main aim of, the, uh, of these things. As well. uh, so over to Rebecca, who's going to be good cop. I'm just going to be bad cop in the background. And just I was just going to say exactly that, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Martin has just cast himself there in uh, in that role, which gives so it gives me absolutely great pleasure to cast myself in the good cop role, and I'm really delighted to be chairing this first session um, this afternoon. Now it is, I was going to say this morning. Um, so this session is about decentering research, and we've got um, a lovely lineup of four excellent um, ECA presentations. We have got um, in this order. If I just get my document in front of me, we have um, Fabrice, Isla, um, Sophie and Elizabeth who are going to be speaking to us. So what I'll do is um, introduce each speaker in turn. And as Martin said, they'll have about 10 minutes to, uh, to speak to us on their topic. And um, then we'll have time for about one question, I think, after each presentation. And then we'll have a wider discussion at the end. So you can store up your questions for the end if you want to or um, have them there ready for the end of the presentation. So our first speaker this afternoon is Fabrice Roger from the University of Bristol, who's going to be speaking to us on decentering laicity. So Fabrice is a teaching associate currently at the University of Bristol. He teaches French language and culture. He came to Bristol in 2012, having worked in a couple of institutions in Wales previously. Um, he finished his doctorate in January 2020, so quite recent, well done. Um, and his he did that at Bristol, writing a thesis on an analysis of the representation of Islam and Muslims by French commentators from 9-11 to the 2015 Paris attacks, analysing the language used by prominent French commentators to disseminate specific ways of thinking about Islam and Muslims in France. He's published several articles on this topic and he's now working on his first monograph on, on this topic. So I'll hand over now to Fabrice to speak on decentering de rather laïcité. Thank you very much, Fabrice. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca. Am I okay to share my screen? Absolutely. Yeah, I do need a couple of slides anyway. Uh, sadly, I, I didn't have time to, uh, to rehearse or time this, so I hope that uh, Martin doesn't have to intervene to stop me. Um, yeah, so as you said, so the thesis I, I completed recently looks at uh, the language used by prominent French commentators to, to disseminate ways to think about Islam and to promote a certain sense of uh, Republican identity. And previous scholarship uh, on, on, on Islam in France uh, tends to define Islam uh, and, and Muslims according to culture uh, as people of, of varying degrees of religious devotion. My research, on the other hand, takes a much more uh, orthodox approach as it defined Islam and Muslims um, as a set of religious beliefs and people who actively adhere to those beliefs, basically practicing Muslims. And this is the perspective from which I write my thesis as a practicing Muslim myself. So I depart from uh, the existing literature on France and Islam, as I said, uh, insofar as it defines uh, Islam according to, to culture. And it is, um, <clears throat> sorry, this existing literature uh, highlights the uh, increasing Islamophobia that is uh, inherent in French mainstream uh, thought over the last few decades. And although I do not deny this uh, Islamophobia, actually what I seek to, uh, to, to highlight with my uh, definition of Islam Muslim is how insidious this, uh, this Islamophobia is, insofar as many French commentators over the last two decades have in fact uh, welcomed some sort of cultural Islam, which Fabrice, could you just move your microphone up slightly because you keep cutting out? Yeah. 
Is it better now? Uh, it's when you turn your head away, it just cuts out. Oh, so okay. Try, try I'm, and keep I'm, looking I'm, forward if you can. <laughs> I'm going to look straight. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, um, a number of French commentators have in fact welcomed some sort of, of cultural Islam over the last two decades, which in turn has exacerbated the exclusion of people who uh, identify as, as practicing, practicing Muslims. So I'm aware that the definitions that I use uh, of Islam and Muslim as religious belief and people practicing Muslim, basically, I, I am aware that it might be problematic and some might see it as um, essentialization. Um, Jim Wolfries, for example, uh, in his excellent book, uh, Republic of Islamophobia, he deplores the essentialization behind Islamic tropes that uh, identify Muslims as representatives of the religion rather than individuals in their own rights. What I seek to do by adding practice to my definitions of Islamic and, 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 and Muslim is, is not to exclude anyone from being Muslim, of course. I mean, as a Muslim myself, I, I believe that anyone that identifies as a Muslim is a Muslim, in fact. But what I'm trying to do by adding practice to my definition, again, is to seek the void left by the existing literature that overlooks practicing Muslims by minimizing their importance in the fight against Islamophobia. And therefore, I am very critical of such concepts as uh, Islam des Lumières, championed by none other than uh, you know, France's infamous Bernard-Henri Lévy. Because Islam des Lumières, as defined by Lévy and others, is mere cultural heritage, and it is void of, of any sort of practice. However, it is compatible in Levy's eyes with Republican values of laicity. And the fact that Wolfries, in his cogent analysis, as I said, does not mention once their shell, um, it is a noteworthy illustration of the need for my research, of the gap I seek to fulfill. Because Wolfries, uh, of course, mentions uh, the crass Islamophobia of people such as um, Alain Finkielkraut or Eric Zemmour. However, again, uh, Wolfries, but I could also cite uh, Thomas Deltombe again in the excellent book L'Islam Imaginaire, La Construction Médiatique de l'Islamophobie en France, uh, 1975-2005. They miss a point which is that the normalization of anti-Muslim prejudice has been underpinned by the representation of Islam by some, in appearance, well-meaning commentators who extend a helping hand to those they see as the good Muslims, and therefore further exacerbates the exclusion of those they uh, describe as the bad ones. Hence, by putting religious practice at the center of my definitions of Islam and Muslim, I highlight the fact that this Islamophobia, Islamophobia by omission, i.e. that omit to include practicing Muslims into their definition of what is a good Muslim. Then I highlight the fact that this Islamophobia by omission goes unnoticed by a broader, by a cultural definition of Islam which is the one found in, in the existing literature. So by adopting this overlooked point of view, I intend to contribute to current reflections on uh, Muslims in France and more widely on the decolonization of French studies and modern languages for that matter. Because decolonial pedagogy is meant to decenter our assumptions and an assumption made by, uh, let's call them global North academics, is that the active practice of Islam is irrelevant in the fight against Islamophobia, which, in my view, stems from an unconscious Western circular bias. So I dissented these, these assumptions and I highlight the prejudice, once again, against practicing Muslims found behind such benevolent concepts in appearance as Islam des Lumières. 
that portrays uh, practicing Muslims as the unacceptable to the secular norm, as opposed to their uh, non-practicing counterparts. What I advocate is a representation of practicing Muslims as, in fact, unexceptional citizens. And I believe this is necessary to uh, overcome the tropes that sees, say, Islamic dress or halal di uh, dietary requirements as a political statement. Tropes that are based on a conception of laicity, uh, which believes in the, the necessary confluence of political secularism, cultural secularism, and societal secularism. In a sense, this conception of laicity is akin to a strict form of monotheism, whereas I, on the other hand, uh, advocate, if I may say, a, a trinity of secularism that would see those three entities as uh, distinct and not necessarily opposing one another. And that's it, I hope I uh, did not go over time. No, you absolutely did not, Fabrice. That was that was just oh, under oh, ten minutes. So oh, so well yes. done. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, that was so interesting and really lovely outline of of what you're doing and the gaps that you're filling and so on. Um, does anybody have a question? We have time for, as I said before, one, one time for one question after the papers and discussion afterwards. So anybody got a question at this stage right now? I can't see whether any hands are up. Actually, let me just. Um, Fabrice, could you possibly? Thank you. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Um, I can't see any hands up. Anybody want to ask Fabrice anything? OK, in that instance, I just have uh, well a quick and I think probably really basic question, Fabrice, for you that um, I was wondering that you you mentioned that in your your work, you've been looking at sort of post 9-11, um, post 2015 commentators in terms of what you've just described to us about approaches and understandings. How have things like I say, it's probably going to be a really obvious question, but how have things shifted and moved on? from the previous understandings of representation and so on to the after effects of those seismic events? Mm -hmm. What we see is that um, there was, <clears throat> after 9-11, a, uh, a, a clear willingness to, to distinguish, uh, say, Islam from Islamism. And uh, there, was, there was space for, uh, you know, practicing Muslims. Whereas increasingly we can see that um, Islamophobia is is being justified. The fear of Islam is seen as a as a legitimate uh, as a legitimate uh, behavior, basically, because you know, those events having happened uh, and they are seen as 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 um, as proofs, basically, to the fact that uh, Islam might inherently, according to these commentators, uh, be uh, intrinsically intrinsically, sorry, um, a threat basically for the Republic. So yeah, we, we see a shift. Uh, post 9-11, there is a clear willingness to, you know, trade carefully and distinguish again, Islam from Islamism, uh, you know, the Muslims from the terrorists um, and, and some, you know, accommodation for, for practicing Muslims. Whereas if you look at post uh, 2015 uh, writings, then clearly there are good cultural non overtly practicing muslims and those trying to impose their religious beliefs over uh, to different society basically so brilliant yeah, it is a shift that, that we can see that's really interesting thank you so much it's really nice outline um great right then so let me just get my little um other screen up while i'm talking so i'm gonna hand over right now to Isla Patterson from the University of Leeds, who's going to be speaking to us on alternative centres, the importance of location in the works of uh, Leila Slimani. So Isla is a PhD student currently at the University of Leeds, and she's working on the works of Slimani within the context of the transnational, pu of transnational public spheres, looking particularly at representations of location, space, place and the body. And she's supervised by a lovely team of Andy Stafford and Jim House at Leeds. So Isla, I will give you the floor right now and um, look forward to hearing 
your paper. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I'll just share my group right now. All right. Um, sorry. Where is it? Um, there we go. Um, so there is does everyone can see that and hear me okay? Cool. Okay. So yeah, my PhD is um, sort of focused on the works of Leila Slimani. And what I've sort of recently kind of stumbled across is um, thinking about her work in terms of like different locations, spaces, place, and um, how these interact with how she's received in France um, and Morocco and beyond. Um, you probably all know who she is um, as she occupies a real sort of central position in um contemporary French literature. Um, she won the Prix Goncourt in 2016 for Chanson Douce, and she's um, Macron's représentant de la francophonie. So she's firmly established in the sort of French um, academy, and um, she sort of arguably adheres to sort of this traditional, um, this typically French tradition in terms of um, how she's perceived as close to Frenchness and whatever that means, and the kind of historical and cultural notions of French écriture. Um, she was voted the second most influential French person in 2018. She was ahead of Kylian Mbappé, so she's very well known in France and around, arguably around the world as well, um, especially, I think, with the English translations of her um, earlier fictional work. Um, which has obviously been translated into English and had um, relative success in the States and in the UK. Um, so her, uh, I've, I've kind of put a map here um, and I wanted to start with her earlier fictional work, um, which kind of launched her into the sort of position she's in today. Um, and I've put this old map of Paris because I wanted to kind of evoke this idea of the as as people have mentioned before the kind of traditional uh, what's seen as the traditional center of French literature and publishing. Um, so Chanson Douce and Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre, um, I think Chanson Douce came out in 2016 and Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre was her first novel in 2014 um, and they both deal with themes relating to sort of the contemporary enclosed bourgeois Parisian apartment and the women that interact with these spaces. Um, so they, and they have a very specific style, they're short, they're clipped, um, and they have a shock impact. If you don't know, Chanson Douce is about a, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this if anyone's not um, read it, um, Chanson Douce is about a um, nanny that goes to work for a bobo family in Paris and um, she ends up murdering the two children which you, you find out at the beginning and then you sort of retrace um, what kind of the, the build-up to this event. Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre is about um, a woman with a sex addiction and she kind of this the, her addiction takes over her life and um, she puts that above everything, like her friendship, her marriage, her child, her job. Um, so both texts kind of deal with the gendered and also the racial and class demarcations of Parisian urban space. And for readers in France, they're all arguably, you know, very familiar in terms of location and space, so things that people can kind of envisage quite easily. Um, However, more recently, she sort of just appeared to disrupt this centering um, in two ways. She publicly maintains the, the Moroccan aspects of her identity because she's, she's Franco-Moroccan and she holds dual um, citizenship. Um, but also in the way that she's moved physically and metaphorically um, from this sort of bourgeois Parisian centre. So... Um, her more recent writing has looked has considered other urban spaces such as Venice in Italy and Meknes in Morocco. And so this kind of this idea of dislocation, which I've been really interested in, um, thinking about what that means in terms of decentering and the effect this might have or, um, for her readership and how she's received. Um, <clears throat> because 
what's also really interesting to me is this this shift in physical location has also been a shift there's also been a shift with um genre and style as well so obviously chanson douce as i've mentioned kind of this quick novel um it's very short and clipped and she's then moved to the essay with le parfum des fleurs la nuit which came out in 2017 which you can see on the top left here with the map of venice um She's also published a graphic novel, which you can see bottom right, which is linking to the Moroccan space. And I'll, I'll explain this a bit more in a second. Um, and she's also gone into the lengthier um, family saga with her most recent work. The first of the trilogy, Le Pays des Autres, came out in, um, I actually can't remember, 2020, I think. And the second one, Regarde nous danser, came out in February this year. And they are very closely related to Meknes, which is where um, her family in Morocco are from. I mean, it's loosely based on her family history. Um, her maternal grandmother, who's from Alsace, uh, migrated to Morocco with um, her grandfather, who was a um, officer in the colonial army, I believe. And so it's loosely based on that. So there's this really interesting shift um, from the Parisian centre and I've also put a map of Lisbon here at the bottom because she's now moved out of Paris and she's writing from Lisbon. I think that's a really another interesting to think about um, finding like a neutral point of contact to write from. So I hope I'm probably I don't know how long I've got. Hopefully I'm not oh, going too far. Um, You've got plenty of time. OK, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> OK, cool. So. I will start with her essays in non-fiction. So, Sex et Mensonge, which you can see at the bottom here in 2017, was a collection of testimonies from young women in Morocco talking about their experiences with sex, sexuality and gender norms in a country where the law punishes and outlaws all form of extramarital um, sex, as well as homosexuality and prostitution. So um, she apparently got the idea for the um, text when she was touring in Morocco with Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre and um, lots of women apparently came up to her wanting to share their experiences with um, sort of similar things. Um, so in one section of the text she points out that Morocco's modesty laws do not come from Islamic law um, as people often think they come from in fact French colonial law. So she's very keen to defend like French universalist values and secularism and, and, and this kind of enlightenment um, thinking she's also quite critical of France and the government and that can be seen in her journalism as well um so then if we shift from Morocco over to Venice here Le Parfum des Fleurs la Nuit is part of a series of essays published with Edition Stock called Man Nuit au Musée so the author is invited to spend a night alone in a museum and reflect on their experiences there um other writers in the series are, um, include Kamel Daoud and Christophe Onodi Bio and Adel Abdesmed. So um, her text is largely autobiographical and it offers an introspective reflection on what it means to be confined as a writer, the importance of literature in her life, as well as reflections on her childhood in Morocco. Um, and I think that's really interesting thinking about the question of confinement and being locked in somewhere. Um, especially in the sort of post, well, during COVID world, but also this idea of decentering and also in oneself as well as um, outside. Um, and we also have the Bon Dessiné or the graphic novel, which is bottom right. So we're going back to Morocco again. And this is based on Sex et Mensonge. So it's three chron chronological chapters, which rewrites the narrative of people's experiences that she had in the original text. And so she's taking one genre and transforming it into another. Um, and apparently this is the book she carries with her now when she's touring Morocco. And she said it's because it's more accessible. There's pictures it, for younger people in particular. She's mentioned it's a better way to kind of get into dialogue with them. So I think, again, that's another interesting way of thinking about decentering not only um, in physical location, but also in genre. Um, and then, as I, I'll just quickly mention, the um, family saga novels, which we still in Morocco, but going more specifically to Meknes. 
So Le Pays des Autres tells the story of Mathilde, who meets Amine, um, and she moves to Morocco. As I've said, it's inspired by her own family history. Um, and I think it's interesting because situating her earlier stories in contemporary France with Chanson Douce and Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre um, meant that arguably familiarity with the place could be sort of more or less assumed, whereas she, with colonial Morocco, especially for a French, it's for, obviously it's for a French publisher, so it's largely for a French audience, colonial Morocco demands a much fuller and more realistic description of place. So it's obviously a much longer text, and um, she used Mathilde's external perspective as like as a foreigner um, to provide this for the reader. Um, both texts and the second one regarding the Don't Save follows the story of Mathilde's daughter, um, and it kind of continues. Uh, both texts employ polyphonic voices, so there's this shifting perspective throughout the characters. Where in the other other fictional work, it's there's much more of a singular sort of view. Um, and the world of the books is situated in place and time. So it's interesting to think about as well. Yeah, the decentering of voices. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll I'll stop talking now. Um, so yeah, I just think it I think my point is I think it's really interesting to think about her work in times in terms of this metaphysical location and the shift. Um and how does this self-decentering help redefine the peripheries around who is perceived to be one and of the French cultural center? And how can we unpack problematic assumptions of what is deemed French or not? Um, so yeah, that's that's it. Sorry for running over. Thanks, Anna. That's great. You you weren't that that far over. It's absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, that was that was so so interesting. I mean, I I say that as somebody who I mean, I'm a medievalist. I don't know the work of of um, Slimani, and that was just a delightful insight into um, who she is and what she does. Um, so. Um, Sophie, is that your hand up for a question? Lovely, right yeah, in. Yes. Hi, Isla. That was that was really interesting. I am um, also not familiar, particularly with Simani's works, but um, yeah, I really enjoyed that presentation. I was just wondering. I know you spoke a little bit towards the end about um, the. It just yeah, I was I was looking at the maps and I was just kind of thinking to myself, yeah, you spoke a little bit about um, les pays d'autres and how kind of that that location in Morocco lent itself to a more expansive kind of text. Mm -hmm. I wondered if in relation to any of the other locations um, you'd you'd noticed kind of or made any remarks on the relationship between genre and the topographies of the, the various locations. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, yeah, I actually didn't mention it. I was meaning to with um, the text in Venice. So she goes to this museum in Venice um, and spends the night there and reflects on, um, she, she reflects on the art, it's a contemporary art museum, but she kind of more goes into this exploration of her um, growing up in Morocco and also her experiences in Paris. Um, but I, I, I think that the essay, the sort of the exploratory or the um, sort of testing out parameters of the essay lends itself quite well again to that exploring the city. And I've, I've just been writing on this recently um this kind of idea of the flanners and her she's she kind of writes a lot in the first person present tense when she's going around venice and i think obviously i don't think she she could do that maybe in other forms so yeah i think you're right there's definitely that yeah. link between genre and place so shifting to venice also allows her to explore it in this essay style text which yeah. other other sort of um ways might not have allowed for um so yeah, I don't know if that answers, but that's another thing. Yeah, no, it does. I, I particularly liked when you evoked um, like the notion of a, a third space that's mm -hmm. not France yeah. or uh, Morocco, this kind of third space that would mm -hmm. perhaps then facilitate more exploratory work. Um, so yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks. I think for her, she presents it as this kind of neutral space and wh whether it is or not, I think is another question and really interesting to think about in terms of decentering from like a French centre, but it's still a European centre um yeah but then she's like looking for this neutral space and i think with her moving to lisbon recently it's quite interesting she's choosing to write from somewhere else that's kind of in the middle almost of Morocco and france so yeah thank you yeah thank you both for that that was a really interesting question and answer and uh, interplay there that's very nice indeed thank you very much so our next speaker is in fact 
um, Sophie, who we've just met. Sophie's going to be speaking to us um, on the topic of Bienvenue Reviewed, Decentering Hospitality and Contemporary Fr uh, French Visual Culture. Sophie's a PhD candidate in French studies at Newcastle and her doctoral project, funded by the Northern Bridge Consortium, explores the reframing of hospitality in contemporary French visual culture, foregrounding artists' reimagining of the traditional parameters of hospitality in relation to place, sex and the post-human to welcome future articula articulations of L'Hospitalité Française. So, Sophie, without further ado, I'll let you crack on and um, we'll look forward to hearing um, what you have to say on this fascinating topic. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so yes, today um, I'm going to explore the decentering of hospitality in contemporary visual culture. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview of some of the foundations of French hospitality um, and the ways in which even critical depictions of it may reinforce its problematic uh, traditions. And then I'm going to consider two contemporary artworks by artists configured as guests in France, um, which illuminate and subvert some of these dominant notions of hospitality proposing new configurations of hospitality and engagement with the contexts of contemporary France. Um, and it'll be argued that by calling upon these alternative voices and media, approaches to hospitality in French studies may be decentered, which may in turn promote a recentering of hospitality itself. Um, so with hospitality representing in its most basic form, the relationship between host and guest, France has consistently figured in discussions of hospitality and indeed in hospitality. Um, what is common though throughout history is a recourse in the literature to romanticise the hospitality of the past um, in, perceived to a res in, in response sorry, to a perceived crise de l'hospitalité in the present. Um, examples of this include Tahar Ben Jelloun's Hospitalité Française, in which he bemoans that les pays industrialisés ont dû désapprendre l'hospitalité, um, and also that of René Chéret, who speaks of le fossile de l'antique hospitalité, qui est bien passé de mode. Um, and whilst I concur with Benjelour and Chéret that the language of hospitality has been co-opted in, in recent political discourse to justify widespread inhospitality, not just in France, but beyond, um, their evocation of this golden age of hospitality um, is not only misleading, but also, I believe, counterproductive if we're wanting to tackle this crise de l'hospitalité. And that's because in romanticizing hospitality of the past, either explicitly or implicitly, they invoke what we see to be, um, what we will see today to be these problematic foundations of the modern French conception of hospitality. So for example, Chéret directly references Homer's Odyssey, which we can see depicted here in the first image. Um, and that is, con that is commonly considered to be the hospitality text par excellence. And whilst these conventions of Homeric or mythological hospitality have come to inform many of the parameters within which we evaluate French hospitality today, um, with seminal hospitality theorists such as Derrida, for example, using these texts to inform their analyses, um, hospitality is far from unproblematic in such texts. Um, with the Odyssey, for example, solidifying the nature of hospitality um, as a fraternal relation merely facilitated by women whose bodies are uh, presented as naturally hospitable and they therefore perform the silent labour of hospitality without reaping its benefits. And this female sacrifice in aid of hospitality is also replicated in inaugural religious texts of hospitality, which we can see depicted here. Um, this image showing the inaugural hospitality tale of Lot from the book of Genesis, in which Lot is actually rewarded for sacrificing his two daughters um, to the Sodomites instead of handing over his angel guests and thereby dishonouring the code of hospitality. And so whilst many idealised notions of Western hospitality are rooted in these patriarchal ideologies, French hospitality in particular is also constructed uh, via the mythologised hospitality of the revolution. So upon its formation, the new French Republic presented itself as an ultimate host that would provide supranational hospitality in the form of universal asylum, which, although mostly unfounded, successfully solidified France's reputation thereafter as la nation hospitalière and also its mastery as host, which um, Gottman observes to kind of represent the imperialistic undertones of French hospitality, whereby France was able to assert its own influence and virtue um, by offering to bestow rights upon to its guests. 
So as you can see, some of these models of hospitality against which that France is evaluated today are themselves complicit in reinforcing um, problematic modes of hospitality. And we see this reflected even in critical depictions of French hospitality today, um, which is why I've included here this uh, affiche for the film Samba by um, Nakashi and Tolidano. So Samba tells a story of uh, Samba, who's played by Omar Sy, he's a Senegalese sans papier um, who is fighting to stay in France. And whilst the film is overwhelmingly critical of France's hospitality towards its migrant guests, the saving grace, if you like, is the hospitality that Samba receives from Alice, who is played by Gainsbourg, um, who acts as his immigration caseworker and they eventually fall in love. So not only does the film's hospitable relief correlate with these traditional notions of the naturalised hospitable female body, since Alice is also an indirect representative of the French state, the film nonetheless upholds um, the mastery of France's host because it's her who shows hospitality to Samba in her home, in her body, um, and yeah, this film, although critical of French hospitality, does uphold the mastery of France as an albeit flawed host, uh, bestowing hospitality upon a non-French other. So in view of decentering these dominant conceptions of French hospitality, I'd like to argue that contemporary French visual culture may provide a forum for their illumination, subversion, and indeed redefinition in engagement with the context of contemporary France. So while my research also addresses the decentering of dominant emphases in hospitality theory in relation to sex and the post-human, which hopefully we can discuss a little bit later on if there's time, um, I thought that today we'd just look at two works which counter dominant notions of hospitality in relation to place, both of which are created by artists configured as guests within the Republic. So the first of these is this sculpture by Ivan Argote, which um, of course, by recalling the, uh, the obelisque at La Place de la Concorde, which was um, first designated for French acquisition in 1799. It also recalls, therefore, the hypocrisy of this uh, revolutionary hospitality, which saw France simultaneously abuse the hospitality of its colonies for its own gain. And I think as well, the sculpture's positioning at La Défense also intimates this self-serving nature of hospitality, whereby borders may be open to foreign property, but not people. And in its supple, almost anthropomorphous form, Argote's fallen phallus mocks the proud angular forms of La Défense behind it, and indeed the traditional obelisque, thereby illuminating the falsity of the rhetoric of La Nation Hospitalière, whose spatialised host-guest dichotomies are further challenged by this sculpture's imposition in such a public space, which, for me, destabilises France's mastery as host, by enacting a reclamation of French territory on behalf of its post-colonial guests on their terms. And this decentering as France's host may also make space for new hosts and configurations of hospitality in the Republic, which we can see in the second image um, from the Habité Calais series by Lofty Benielis. So by depicting a resident from La Jongle curating and indeed sharing a plan of his home in this way, Benielis counters Calais' synonymousness with inhospitality and reframes it as a site of place making and welcome, with France's migrants, who have consistently represented the limits of French hospitality, conversely reframed as its new agents and pioneers. And I think, much like uh, Argote's curved obelisk, in juxtaposing Wassim's imperfect hand drawn lines with that of the geometric tablecloth next to it, Benielis's composition exemplifies the need to think beyond existing conceptions of hospitality and the need to reshape and remodel them in the image of contemporary France, the YA4 paper acting as a necessary blank canvas, since in continuing to romanticise and trying to emulate hospitalities of the past, France is fated to worsen its crise de l'hospitalité because the foundations of it were, were flawed to begin with. So as such, by decentering dominant notions of French hospitality and foregrounding France's guests in this way, be that through their representation in these images or indeed my projects focus on artists who are configured as guests themselves, not only can approaches to hospitality in French studies be reoriented and revitalised, but they can actually become more hospitable in and of themselves. 
And this is because by prioritising othered voices and non-traditional media in French hospitality theory, we may provoke a paradigm shift which redresses what has become an asymmetrical social relation of hospitality in France. Since true hospitality requires reciprocity between host and guest, this decentering of hospitality in contemporary French visual culture therefore has the potential to recenter hospitality anew, opening up alternative spaces and configurations of French hospitality to redress the equilibrium between host and guest that makes hospitality possible in the first place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Sorry, I'm just messing with my video here. It's not working. Just give me a second. No worries. <laughs> um, not that we need that, but never mind. Um, that, was, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. I learned so, so much from that. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but um, I would be very happy to hand over to um, anybody else who might have a question in the audience, please. I can't actually see. If, Sophie, can you stop sharing your screen so I can... Yes. Um, see people that'd be brilliant thank you okay there we go okay i can see no hands up so um i've got a couple of questions but i think i'll come back to a question on the human and the post-human that you mentioned um possibly in the wider discussion at the end but um for now can you you spoke a lot about um well obviously hospitality and you mentioned host and guest can you yeah. tell us a bit more about what you see as the role of the guest how the guest is configured in the work that you're that you're doing Yes, of course. So, yeah, I think I definitely did touch upon that without actually explaining it properly. I think what's interesting is that the in the hospitality theory, the guest is traditionally constructed in terms of cultural displacement. And that's why so often we, we hear talk of the post-colonial guest. Um, but what I mean, and today as well, that is kind of where the focus was, is on kind of ethnic othering um, as a grounds for, for someone to be configured as a guest, which is... Um, um, which is the reason for which Benielis and Argote can be considered as such. But what, um, what I'm interested in doing in, in my research is also exploring the intersections of, of hospitality, which see France's hosts and guests kind of occupy multiple and at times conflicting uh, roles at the same time. Um, because the thing is with these roles is that they are completely provisional and subject to change and I think whilst that probably wasn't reflected or maybe wasn't reflected through a presentation it's why I always use these inverted commas when we're referring to host and guest because um, whilst you know we might consider cultural displacement as grounds for for someone to be configured as a guest and that probably will be a, my starting point um, I also want to explore other ways by which people may be uh, religiously othered or socioeconomically othered or may deviate from, you know, France's white, masculine, Catholic pouvoir politique. And that can also be grounds for this othering or this, this construction of the guest. Um, and I think that that's actually what Ben Yelis does so well is that in, in his um, exhibition of these photos of Abite Kelly, we've got, you know, Wassim. Who, who's engaged in this process of, of place making and indeed host making, um, situated next to perhaps local Calisiens who have been priced out of their area and having to move to the next uh, city. And they there too then are guests. Um, so yeah, I just find it so interesting. Um, and I think that that's gonna be something that, that, that forms quite an integral part of my project is, is deviating from just the post-colonial cast and kind of pushing it a little bit further to look at ways in which um, these roles are, are, are in flux constantly. Thank you. Great answer. And yeah, re yeah, really, really interesting. Like you say, the way that these these things are kind of sort of shifting almost as you're looking at them. It's 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 amazing. Um, thank you so much. Right then. Um, I'll now move on to introducing to you our fourth speaker for this afternoon. Elizabeth Purdy from the University of Leeds, who, appropriately enough, um, for the post, the, the pre-launch uh, paper, she's going to be speaking to us on the topic of a stomach of genres, broadening the corpus of studies of closure. So Elizabeth is a postgraduate researcher in French and uh, comparative literature at the University of Leeds. She's working on a thesis entitled Towards a Secular Theory of the End, a study of closure in French and English novels from 1700 to the present. And she's supervised by um, David Platten and Richard Hibbert. Um, she has interests beyond 
doctoral research on um, epistolarity, memory studies, and the blue humanities, and she's also published on these these topics. So um, I look forward to hearing what you have to say right now, Elizabeth, and I'll stop talking and hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Rebecca. Thank you for introducing me so nicely. And I just want to say how much I've been enjoying everyone's presentations so far. It's quite a nice format to get everything kind of so succinctly summarised and boiled down to kind of really important information, I guess. And it gives you a good insight into projects as a whole. Um, so my PhD thesis, um, kind of, as Rebecca said, looks at en the endings of literature. And I'm kind of trying in that work to work towards a terminology that can be used to talk about endings more broadly and kind of to think about the ways that kind of time and point of view and um, these different kind of narrative dynamics all play into creating an ending and play into how consonant that ending is with the rest of the work. Um, but this actually isn't the project that I started off doing at all. My project actually started off looking at something very different, um, which was kind of all to do with death and the way that end, literary endings play into kind of ideas of death and religion. Um, but actually what happened as I was kind of doing my kind of literature review of studies of closure that had gone before me was that I realised there was kind of a bit of a problem going on here and that the words that I needed to talk about what I wanted to talk about just didn't exist yet. They weren't really there. Um, because and I think the kind of root of that problem is that narrative closure has always been studied in a very particular way. Um, and with re reference to a fairly static corpus. Um, so Frank Commode, whose book very, you've probably all come across at some point, The Sense of an Ending, is very well known. And he's a kind of a really good example of this kind of fallacy that comes from studies of closure in that he kind of starts, starts off by talking very much about how closure works in literature and about how closure is this kind of dynamic and every book is kind of end oriented and eschatological. Um, and he kind of talks about this and sets it all up and he says popular literature really does that and then he kind of spends the rest of his book talking about kind of a few isolated geniuses that break free from these kind of shackles of closure and who think about closure in a different way and this is kind of a pattern that you see time and time again in everybody that works on closure they kind of talk about it in this way they say narratives are closure all except for these people. And we kind of see the same names coming up. We see Stendhal a lot, we see Balzac, we see Flaubert, and they're kind of the same people that get drawn upon all the time, not just in studies of closure as well. I don't think it's kind of unique to my field, but you see these kind of same authors being pulled out. You see a close relationship between this critical tradition and the kind of narrative um, and kind of literary trajectory more widely. So there's a close relationship here between um, French naturalism between, and French modernism and kind of these texts are lauded and kind of clumped together, even though actually it's a kind of predominantly male, almost entirely white corpus of people who come from quite a specific time frame. And these kind of, I think it kind of creates a model, which I would kind of describe as the individual genius model of, um, narrative openness. So it kind of suggests that narrative openness is something that can only really be achieved by a few people who are willing to break the rules, who are willing to kind of create something more spectacular. Um, and I don't think that kind of models of closure or of openness are adequately explored by this dynamic, because I think that closure in this dynamic is never productively analysed um, because it's dismissed as something kind of lowbrow and unimportant and like as if they've said everything in saying, you know, popular narratives are end oriented and there's no more to it than that necessarily. And I think openness similarly is never productively theorised because, because it's done on such a case by case kind of logic. We're to saying, you know, openness like works like this in Balzac and it works like this in Stendhal and there's never any kind of overarching conclusion. It's very disparate. Um, and also it's kind of just linked to this particular tradition. Um, Yet when we consider kind of the field of French studies more broadly and we kind of work through the nouveau moments of things that are happening now, um, we see quite a different image of openness emerging. And I'm sure that we've all read a book recently that ended with um, probably quite a popular book that ended in quite an open way or watched a TV programme or watched a film that had a cliffhanger at the end. And openness doesn't really hold this position that seems to be theorised in these closural texts, um, closural criticism texts. And um, so this is kind of the 
problem that I seek to address in my research and um, more widely and that I kind of want to look at today. Um, because I think that looking at the same text will kind of always lead us to the same conclusions. So I kind of propose a relatively simple solution to this problem, which is to start looking at a bigger corpus and to look at a corpus that includes um, different genres and a different spans of bigger time period and to generally kind of bring a wider gaze on the idea of openness particularly. Um, and I think it's a shame that this doesn't get done more often because I think one of the big advantages of narratological study, which has quite a reputation of being quite dry and talking about Proust a lot, um, is that if you are theorizing narratives, then you can kind of ignore questions of style and content. And you can just think of anything that has a story as worth studying, but also vaguely equivalent. So um, an episode of Friends is having the same kind of worth and value of narratological study as um, a novel by Balzac and kind of you can draw conclusion um, comparisons between these two things. So I work on the novel so I don't talk about friends but um, that's kind of the ethos that I've kind of tried to bring to my work, the idea that we can group together things that are traditionally not valued as studyable with things that are really traditionally valued as studyable um, and that's kind of why I've got this set of kind of concentric circles on the screen here um, because I think it's a good kind of graphic to show the way that my work which doesn't necessarily decenter in the same way that some of the other works that we've talked about today and um, obviously Isla my colleague here has talked about decentering through kind of Leila Slomani's location I am decentering more through through genre and um, so I think we can kind of have a look at this central circle here and think of it as kind of like the traditional corpus of work um, that's often studied, often theorised. Um, so in this kind of circle, we would have Balzac and Dickens and every author I'm going to kind of mention as I move throughout this thing is actually in my project. So you can kind of see the methodology that's working here. So Balzac and Dickens would kind of be the centre of French and English literary studies um, because they're kind of endlessly theorizing research. They come into all domains. They're a regular kind of, they're a regular appearance in anyone who's draw, looking for an example of something. You'd look to Dickens, you'd look to Flaubert, you'd look to Balzac, you'd look to Stendhal. Um, and I would kind of place on the edge of this works by people such as Jane Austen, Ian McEwan, Patrick Mondiano, because to me, they are studied, but they're often studied in a slightly different way. They're studied in a way as if people are stepping out of this kind of confined, they're thinking about contemporary literature, they're thinking about women's writing. So although they are very centre, they're slightly centre adjacent. Um, and then I think we could move out again to think about texts like Frankenstein by Mary Shelley and um, Trois Femmes Puissantes by Mary Anne Daye, because these are again texts which are very famous and they are studied, but they're often studied in reference to their genre or to a specific school of thought. For example, Anne Daye's text is tied very much to post-colonial literature, rightly or wrongly, um, and Shelley's Frankenstein is tied kind of very much to the nascence of science fiction and romanticism and the Gothic. Um, and then I think we can move out again to think about books like Madeline Miller's Circe, Emily Northam's fiction, um, because these are kind of like clever literature and they are written about, but not that much. And I think that as we move from the kind of the centre to the periphery here, we can kind of, I've not actually done the legwork for this research, but I think I wouldn't be surprised to see a kind of the number of publications on each author kind of dropping down. So from here, kind of um, these kind of like studied clever books that are written about and are increasingly being written about, we can move into kind of realm of popular literature, which does get studied because it gets really widely read, but isn't actually very well seen. So things like um, Sally Rooney's Normal People, Claudia Galli's Les de Furlon, Oniaki Braithwaite's um, My Sister the Serial Killer, all of these texts are perfectly studiable. People probably write undergraduate dissertations, but they they're too, almost too popular to be given an import, a canonical place. They're almost too important to be deemed um, popular, to be deemed worthy of kind of proper serious study, which rightly or wrongly, I think is a dynamic that does play into acad academia a lot. And then on the kind of very edges of this, I have um, books such as Justine Niogre's Chien de Homme, which is a French fantasy book. Um, and then Pierre Signac's Monsieur Cauchemar, 
which is a kind of 1960s French quite obviously your crime novel. And these are books that would only ever be talked about in terms of their genre. Usually people would never draw on and probably unless they're fans of these genres, probably won't even have read them. So that's kind of the dynamic I'm trying to work in treating this kind of centre, treating Balzac in the same way as I'm treating um, Chien de Um, which is a book that I think probably none of you will ever have heard of. And that's kind of the methodology I want to bring to this in order to bring conclusions which are more appropriate for um, narrative more generally. What conclusions can we draw, not just about this specific subset of text, but about narratives overall? What words can we use to describe um, Eugenie Grande that we can also use to describe Monsieur Koshima? How can we talk about these texts as equivalents um, without just going back to the idea that some authors are particularly good at this mode of thinking? And something that I've noticed as I've kind of done this and um, worked to kind of develop this methodology is that genre diversity has brought further diversity with it. And um, so I've got more kind of more texts that were written by women than by men in my thesis, um, partly on purpose, but <laughs> not entirely on purpose. Um, and I've also got texts from kind of lots of other cultures. So I've got um, texts from France, from England, from the USA, which draw on like Senegalese culture, Moroccan text, Nigerian text, Belgian text, Irish text. And I think that kind of this diversity as a big scale, this kind of decentering, has worked to kind of come up with a project that can talk more universally about things. Um, yeah, and it is going to allow me, hopefully, to come up with conclusions about closure and more particularly about openness, which is much less theorised, which are relevant to kind of the entirety of the field rather than just a few texts. So that was quite clumsy, but I'm done. <laughs> that was not clumsy at all, Elizabeth. What is clumsy is me trying to use my video once again. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, that was that was really great. Thank you so much. There's loads in there and I'm sure that um, I mean, I've, I've certainly got quite a few questions that I could ask you, but um, anybody else want to step in and ask Elizabeth anything about what she's just told us or beyond that? Okay, well, I will ask my question and it's, um, it's again, it's quite a basic question, Elizabeth, and um, I apologize for that. And it is also, it's, it's, I'll preface it with the fact that it's one of those questions that could sound like I'm being critical. I don't mean to be critical at all, at all. It's very much uh, a kind of I just want to know about this thing. Um, I mean, at the minute, I feel like I'm working with quite a big corpus. But having heard you speak about what you're doing in your thesis, I realise that I'm just dipping my toe into something and just playing about with <laughs> with a few texts. Um, it's just what I'm interested to hear about is just how are you going to manage this corpus? You know, what are you, how are you going to use these texts? How, how do you propose, um, yeah, just integrating them into, into a thesis? And like I say, this is meant very much in a kind of, I just want to know rather than kind of, oh, I don't think you can do this or anything like that. It's not, um, it's not bad, bad natured at all, I hope. So yeah, how are you, how are you working with these things? No, it's a good question. And it's something that kind of me, Dave and Richard have almost endlessly debated. And yeah, that <laughs> way to do it is. Um, but I think that's the advantage of just looking at endings, really, is that I, because I'm talking about such a specific part of a text, and everything is oriented towards thinking about the end of the novel, there's actually not as much material as there might be, if I was talking about as many not, I think there's something like, I mean, we had a re visiting researcher here the other week who was telling us her corpus of 200, she's got a corpus of 200 texts in her thesis. So at the moment, I'm feeling like mine isn't particularly overwhelming. But I think um, I think in total, I've got maybe 23, 20, between 23 and 25, something around there. Um, and I'm kind of structuring it in that I start each section about each novel with an extract from the end. And I use that to kind of draw me back to, to it and then it's just keeping it as comparative as I can really is the most is, that's my main kind of methodology throughout is to always be drawing links to kind of to talk about Frankenstein and say oh this is actually really like Chanson Russe which are kind of texts that you wouldn't necessarily put together but in terms of the stru narrative structure and the framing you actually can really easily and it's just drawing those links all the time is the kind my kind of main strategy to manage so many things so that we're not just dealing with it here's one book and that's what I think and here's the next book and that's what I think I want them all to work together and to contribute to something larger overall I guess 
that's amazing thank you that's a really great answer as well and uh, yeah just just sounds sounds wonderful um so we have about oh seven or so minutes for a wider discussion i can see a couple of hands up um at this stage um now so before i kind of widen it maybe i see um Sophie, did you have your hand up? And Madeline, you've, you had your hand up for a question. So um, I'll take whatever questions you have at this stage and we'll see what we can do to sort of widen that out um, beyond that as we as we go. So um, Madeline, do you want to go first, please? Um, yeah, thank you so much for these talks um, and, and listening to to you, Elizabeth, talking about you know, having having a bigger corpus made me think also about um, mapping in um, in Isla's case. <clears throat> and I was wondering if, if either of you thought about maybe like digital humanities um, as some kind of way to, on the one hand, maybe take the burden off like all of the close reading that you might need to be doing, um, but also as a way to to kind of what you're what you're both saying is like looking at the bigger picture. Like, are there kind of digital tools that you might be able to use? And I'm asking this as a total novice, so. I'm not look. I'm just. I'm curious. I guess. Sorry, this is quite difficult because we and Isla are actually in the same room, so we're having to be quite careful to not get terrible Zoom echoes. Um, I mean, for me, I actually find the internet frustratingly unhelpful in my project because people are so reluctant to put spoilers on the internet. So I find it really, really hard to narrow down my corpus using any kind of digital tool because the last thing people type online is how a book ends. Um, so I've done quite a lot of frustrating reading, reading books that I think might end in one way and they don't. And then that's kind of been a wasted job. But um, I honestly don't know if there are tools I could use more broadly. I sometimes use a diagram. That's what I would say. Um, but I don't think that they're necessarily. Could I use text as a data? I don't know how I would, is my honest answer. Yeah, that, yeah, that's but that's because I'm useless, not because your question isn't um, valid. I mean, I don't know about you, Isla, if you'd have anything more. <laughs> oh, no. That nearly went. Um, I, yeah, that's a really interesting question as well. And I haven't, and I feel like I've thought about it and, and the idea of doing some actual physical maps would be really cool and useful I think but I haven't I haven't tried it and I don't actually know how I would go about it because again I'm also a bit pathetic with uh anything more than like your average searching something on the library website so <laughs> I, I I think that would be really that would be really good though but sorry I, I can't give you much more I mean, yeah, I guess I was just wondering, like, maybe it's harder with more recent novels, but like, yeah, corpus linguistics, um, or yeah, like, even just like looking through every time these places are mentioned um, in, in the text, like you can, like, so you don't have to count them as a person, and then kind of seeing like, what gets associated with these different places? Um, or like, how can you map these kind of textual mentions i don't know it's just a thought or like again for for elizabeth's project i would have also no idea but i imagine that like there are studies done on how i don't know like the kind of the shape or the structure of the narrative or something anyway just a thought thank you so much for your answers though thank you thank you yeah great answers to to that question yeah i um I find the work that people do with digital humanities and so on absolutely fascinating, but I wouldn't have a clue where to start myself either. So, um, yeah. Uh, any other questions from, from people that either pick up on anything that any of our speakers said in their individual papers or that might draw our um, discussions on decentering together? Sophie. Hello. Evidently, I'm also inept with technology. <laughs> Couldn't even unmute myself. Um, yeah, no, that just got me thinking then, Elizabeth, about um, I was struck by just by the diversity of your corpus and I was just wondering I'm not sure what stage you are at but I was just wondering at, at this kind of preliminary stage whether you'd I don't know whether you'd you'd found any kind of surprising or perhaps um like noteworthy takeaways or kind of conclusions from 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 comparing endings from such diverse sources Um, sorry, we are having serious technical <laughs> there. Um, yeah, I would say genuinely I'm quite pleased with how unsurprised I've been by the conclusions that I've found in that, you know, things that are coming from different cultures 
us you can still use the same kind of vocabulary to talk about them and um, so I mean one of the kind of terms I've kind of got for endings is multiple endings so where things are you're given kind of three different options how things end and I've got um a text there one's from Singapore one's from kind of France and one's from um England and in that kind of dynamic the vocabulary and the endings are working in really similar ways and they're drawing on um very different cultures and very different traditions but to produce quite a similar effect with relation to those traditions mm -hmm. and I think that um I mean that's probably kind of an overlap that exists between mine and your work as well in that the kind of those Okay, so a few more people have uh, started to drift back in now. Um, so um, welcome to um, this afternoon's um, session. I'm going to hand over to uh, Emmanuel Labo, who is going to uh, introduce us to uh, uh, to this particular session. Uh, Emmanuel, over to you. Thank you very much, Martin. And um, well, hello, everybody. Um, nice not to see you. <laughs> um, I guess it's always a difficult slot ju just after lunch, so I'll try to uh, prevent you from falling asleep after a big lunch, maybe. We're lucky we're not in France because they would have had wine, so my work would have been even more difficult. Um, yeah, so um, I think I have to share my screen. Martin, is that the way it works? Uh, yeah, if you've got something to show us, yeah. <laughs> yes, I've got something to show. <laughs> Okay, so I've got my my screen, and can you see that? Can you see my screen? No. Okay, so I haven't shared my screen yet. Sorry, I'm used to um, MS Team, not not Zoom. So uh, I yeah, think that's... it may have happened. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. So I'll try maybe to minimize the pictures there so that you can see my slides. So, um, yeah, I'm Emmanuel Labo. And since I, I first agreed to take on a session for, for this uh, AUPHF plus annual event, well, things have moved on and uh, I was uh, initially planning to share with you something that would have been more traditionally uh, related to, to research, my own research, which is more uh, in linguistics and the decentering uh, research was in my case linked to sociolinguistics and trying to move away from um, the, the standards and the, the central focus often on uh, French French. I won't be talking about that at all because things have changed and um, you probably have a hint of what has changed in uh, the indication next to, to my name. So uh, I will I will address you this afternoon in my role as one of the AHRC uh, Research Fellow for the Future of Language Research. I suspect you, you may have seen last summer that the AHRC uh, launched a one-off call, uh, which was uh, the Fellowship for the Future of Language Research, by which the AHRC was calling for, for two people to do some horizon scanning work to basically advise them on the, their future funding and their future priorities for research. So they wanted uh, two people to do that in uh, five months. And it sounded a bit, I don't know if you have the sound, but it was a bit like mission impossible because uh, the work involved, well, identifying threats, risk, opportunities, current issues, and also see how, well, 
all that pitch, picture would align with uh, AHRC priorities. So I won't leave the music on because uh, that might be too distracting. So we were tasked for that. And in fact, oops, <laughs> I didn't want to press that part. Okay, sorry. And in fact, uh, instead of two fellows, they appointed three fellows. So those people are first uh, Nicola McLelland, who is a professor of German and history of linguistics at the University of Nottingham. And you may be familiar with the, the work of Nicola uh, around uh, the history of uh, foreign language teaching in this country, the whole net, uh, network. The second person uh, is uh, Michel Mike Lloyd, who is a chair in Gaelic in uh, Aberdeen University. And I, I suspect that I was an afterthought um, as the third person because I didn't quite answer the goal the way I think AHRC had um, planned. So, um, we are working together to produce a single report for the AHRC, but we all came with independent projects. So we didn't apply uh, at all together, but uh, we are coming with our various strengths, uh, expertise to, to try to give as broad a picture of our discipline as possible. So Nicola was um, probably the good student uh, among us because she answered the, the call uh, very close to, to what was asked. And she suggested that uh, as part of the horizon scanning, we would focus on what academic thought should be uh, the, the priorities for research and funding that the AHRC uh, should support. You may have, and I hope you have seen it, the um, uh, survey that Nicola um, circulated. I think it was late March and it was on for most of April, I think. Um, I hope you have had an opportunity to answer the survey. Um, from, from what I've heard, the survey was quite successful with over 500 academics and PhD students um, answering. And there was also uh, quite a healthy number of people wanted to, to take part in a focus group to go deeper in, in the questions um, that were discussed in, in the survey. I was told also that there, there was um, quite a high proportion of colleagues in French studies who uh, were interested in saying more. And obviously, uh, because we've got limited resources and um, we, we don't have all the time in the world, all the people who volunteer couldn't be uh, surveyed in focus groups. So I saw that this opportunity, this event might be um, a way of giving more people uh, the opportunity to, to tell AHRC a bit more about what they think they should support uh, research-wise. Nicola uh, so was focusing on the more academic uh, part uh, of the question. For Michel, as a chair of Gaelic, obviously the focus was uh, on the on indigenous languages and language policy. Also, um, Michel is chair of the Confucius Institute at Aberdeen, so she was covering quite a, a few um, less mainstream languages, let's say. As for me, I did something completely different. As you may or may not know, um, about a year ago, Aston University, which is the university where I uh, work and teach, announced that they would discontinue their modern foreign language provision. So um, I guess I've been in the last year very much at the forefront of the reality of uh, language uh, research and a language uh, position in the um, uh, current British society. So when I submitted my application, I decided to go uh, with a bottom 
uh, approach. And instead of asking academics what they so they should research, well, I, I decided to go for uh, another approach. And basically, I started with uh, BRAM, the acronym, and then I had to find words to, to fit those four letters. So my project is Birmingham Research for Upholding Multilingualism. And I've chosen Birmingham, obviously, because it's very much where I am, but also because Birmingham has a very central um, city in England as the second biggest city after London, which after all is not really Britain. Um, I saw that the kind of thing I would uncover for Birmingham could be uh, quite useful and could be scaled up. So my project is looking uh, as what non-academic stakeholders seem, um, think language research should be about. And this is also something that includes unwitting uh, stakeholder or even unwilling stakeholder. So people who think that nobody cares about languages and after all, we're not in the European Union anymore. Everybody speaks English, so we don't need language research. So in my project, I've got four strands and I'm speaking to people in uh, education. For example, as part of the project, I've been uh, carrying out a survey at Aston, the Aston Languages Survey. I was quite amazed I could do that, but the EDI committee uh, was keen to, um, to look at the diversity of languages and how languages uh, could uh, be a way of including people in the university's community. Uh, I gave a talk uh, for I EDI week last Friday, and at the moment I'm also uh, leading focus group with, with different groups of people. So uh, students, research active staff, support staff, teaching staff, uh, researchers. I'm also serving uh, a group of schools in Birmingham. So different types of school. We've got uh, schools that are grammar school, we've got comprehensive schools. So giving a, a, an overview of the different types of schools in the city. The second area is a business because I now sit in a college of business and social sciences and businesses are very much uh, one of the leading area in the university, one of the priorities. So I was quite keen to see how uh, languages could uh, look at, um, could maybe improve and support a business. What I had in mind when I first started were things such as international business, export, and this kind of thing, the, the kind of work uh, Wendy Ares Bennett has been uh, covering in a, a recent report. You, you may have seen it. But I discovered some things that I was going because we have in my university a research center uh, that supports uh, people from um, community background, so immigrant backgrounds, refugee background, to uh, create their own business. So it supports entrepreneurship from those less obvious parts of the population. And it happens that they feel that languages are a very important part of the work they do and often the lack of language language and linguistic skills is uh, a barrier in the, the work they're doing. Public services is also a big one and some of my colleagues have been working during the COVID crisis on the provision of information in community languages. So uh, I was already aware that um, there, there were needs there. And actually, as we were going through the, the, the fellowship, things happen in the world. And uh, as you know, at the end of um, February, there was the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, which has meant that there were lots of people moving around and Ukrainian coming to this country. Um, what was very striking was that there are very few Ukrainian interpreters registered uh, in, in the UK, there, there are none in the Birmingham region. The closest ones are in the London area. So together with a, a colleague who used to be a public service interpreter 
uh, trainer, we put together um, a, a training, an emergency training for Ukrainian speakers who were willing to support uh, refugees by acting as interpreters. So we started last week to provide them with uh, basic training into what it means to be an interpreter and giving them um, hints on doing it uh, the best in the best possible way. And finally, we also had a, um, a strand on, on culture, so the way different languages appear in the linguistic, uh, in the cultural landscape of Birmingham. So this is the, the background for um, my own research and the more general uh, fellowships. So I would like now to, to make you work, you know, I'm not the only one who will be speaking far from it. And I would like to, to take this time as a, an opportunity uh, for us to, to discuss um, what could be the priority for uh, future research, language research, but also French studies research in this specific context. And I thought that the idea of decentering, which is uh, the focus uh, of today, uh, could, could be uh, an answer. So what I've done is that I have prepared a series, what well, three series uh, of questions uh, about um, major themes. So the first one is about decentering or research themes. It was pretty much what I had in mind when I first started. So trying maybe uh, to research um, other areas of French studies than the mainstream. The second one is decentering the disciplinary approach. So who could we work with? Uh, with whom could we collaborate to make our research more innovative, more interesting, more effective? And the, the third one is about decentering academia. So the idea here is, well, maybe not start from what we fancy researching as researcher, but maybe see how uh, we can benefit society in the whole um, impact, public engagement, a uh, culture that the REF has generated. How can we do that better? So I will now stop sharing my my screen i see that we've got i'm not quite sure how, how we could do that so shall we go maybe in in small three small groups yeah i could put i can create three um okay. breakout rooms okay um i put the the documents you sent me emmanuel they're in the chat so but i don't know if everybody can see them because i put them in during the break um okay. So if people could have a look in the chat and see, can you see there's there's three word documents in there, or at least I put three word documents in there. Can you tell me whether you can see the Madeline says she can? Yeah, people can. Okay. So if I what I can do is I sign three, I create three breakout rooms. Yeah, before you um, I, I could maybe explain how how we will do it. I wasn't quite sure how many people we would have. So because we will have fairly small groups, I guess it might be. Uh, good if we um, maybe go through all the questions. Maybe we could take 15 minutes in our group to discuss and we take the three sets of questions and we spend five minutes on each. So I give you, uh, as you will see in the, the focus group instruction, some very directive instruction like I would have had for my students in COVID time, like, you know, you choose a, a, a chair for your group who will look at the time and make you move on if you're not covering everything. Somebody who will make notes and be the secretary and then the brave one who will speak and share uh, the, the main points of your small group discussion in the main group when we come back together. The idea is that we, I won't come to you to the small groups and that way any um, ideas, any point that is made in the main group won't be related to uh, anybody in particular. So if you have very contentious thing you want to do, it will be reported by your a group reporter, but it may not be traced back to you. So I guess this is a way of giving you more freedom in saying what you really want to say. And please feel free to use this uh, as a place where you can 
talk to EHRC by telling them, well, maybe, you know, I'm doing this kind of research or thinking of this kind of research. And at the moment, you, you don't fund that and you should really. And the report we will be writing for HRC will uh, include this, this kind of thing. So this is your moment, your opportunity to, to lobby and to pitch for whatever you, you are researching. So please don't miss the opportunity. So I think I've said enough now. So it's yeah. Uh, um, just just to clarify, if you're in break, if you're in room one, your focus group one, room no, two, focus no, group we'll, two. No, no, well. we'll, yeah. we we will do. I've changed it because the groups are quite. Oh, small. okay. But we will spend fifteen minutes and five minutes for each group, uh, each focus group questions. So everybody okay. will everything but because they are sorry i was uploading documents when you said that so I yeah i mean that was initial plan but <laughs> you need to be okay at okay so how many folk how many groups do you want three uh, three three groups and everybody yeah. does all the questions and spend about five minutes for each sheet of questions is that clear okay. for everybody yeah okay so and everybody yeah okay. so we've got 15 minutes from now so I see you later. Okay. I won't join a group, Martin, to let people. Uh, I think you, 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 I can't, you're already assigned to one. Okay. I can't unassign you. Okay. Um, I, but you can leave it. I, I will leave it because I want people okay. to. Okay. There's only two people in there though. Okay. Because oh. I, I'm not assigned to one, but I can go and join them to room room three. The room two is also only got two people in there at the moment. Yeah, people are a bit shy when it's all about joining. Uh, I think it's so. Yeah, so if you, if you don't join room three, that's fine. Just leave it. Okay. I'm not um, I, I think can... somebody else has just left their thing running and hasn't hasn't joined a group. Um. Oh, okay. So, yeah. No, okay. So I'll go and join a breakout room. Okay. Hello, Gabriel. Can you hear me? Hello?
Hello, welcome back. I was starting to feel very lonely here. I don't think Martin looked at the clock for the 15 minutes. So I just saw, oh, have I done something wrong? <laughs> Press the wrong button. Oh, more people are joining us. That looks more like it. Okay, great. Welcome back, everybody. So we haven't got much time left, but I'd like to, to hear from your uh, speakers, your, the people reporting for the group. What was first your opinion about how we can decenter our research team? So who are the, the people reporting? Group one, did you? Decide. We didn't select anyone, but here I am self-selecting. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Come on, Ashley. People can correct me as I go if I've said something that isn't quite right. Um, yeah, we did just about manage to look at all three themes, but we did speak the most on this one on um, decentering research. Um, I think our general feeling was that actually, you know, recently there has been a move towards decentering, um, you know, especially around kind of post-colonial studies and, and um, you know, moving beyond the text and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, but that can keep going, like that should keep going. But I think our, there is a tension because we're always going to be pulled back to kind of classic theories, big names in theory, big names in literature, big names, you know, it's kind of hard to resist that because in the end it gives validity to, to our research at times as well. Um, so, you know, we spoke about examples where, you know, yeah, you might be working on something new and fresh, but you feel that you should use Jeanette to justify it or Ricoeur or something, you know. Um, so I think we, we felt a little bit of a, a tension in, in trying to do different things because there's still a lot of validity or worth given to to the central things. 
Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. could the AHRC do something to, to help us uh, be daring and go maybe for those uh, uh, frameworks that are not so prestigious? Yeah, I think on that? Oh, well, just, just a small suggestion from us. I think we we a lot of what we were thinking was around things we'd like to do, but the structures don't let us feel like we can do them. You know, a lot around yeah, where worth is put in things and like maybe we'd love to see more funding that's more flexible about the outcomes, not necessarily about achieving certain publications in certain places, but more about, yeah, I guess, engaging with certain peoples or, you know, doing something that's new just for the sake of it rather than with a particular loose, aim. Loose research. Yeah. Yeah, great. Anything on that from the other groups? No, I think we, um, I don't know what number group we were, so I'm sorry if we're muscling in group two. <laughs> we were three. three. Oh, shall I shut up? <laughs> Near enough. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we said the same sort of thing, really, um, that, that actually we've made a lot of progress towards, you know, decentering. And, and I was just explaining where, yeah, UPHF plus comes from in, in relation to this, which is that in some ways we want to be a little bit more like um, Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American studies where um, you do have this greater diversity. It is, you know, we, we, have, we reflect far more the um, geographic diversity of the French speaking world. Um, and, and we are, we, we, we do, we are progressing towards that, but we're coming from a legacy, which is, you know, uh, a, a, which is very Paris centric, which is very, um, you know, French when I was undergraduate was, was nearly always just literature, uh, language and literature. And so therefore that, that reinforces that sense of the center. So we have a, we probably have a much firmer sense of center than um, many other language disciplines. So we, we, we have more to fight against really. Uh, but this doesn't mean to say that you jettison Paris, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you don't jettison the center still. Um, it's, it's, it's there and, and but, but actually it's sort of looking, and it's not always just a case of looking at the relationship between the periphery and the center, you know, it, it, to look at the periphery for its own interest as well. And I think once we start to do that, then uh, we, we, we do diversify things. So then, we, we, you know, in terms of funding, um, you know, the AHRC has to take more risks in what it funds. And I think this just backs up what Ashley says, you know, I think, think if they, they, they sort of really do want to kind of um, support, um, um, you know, uh, innovative and, um, groundbreaking um, research, they have, to, they have to take more risks, they have to be a bit more like a lead cube um, in terms of, you know, encouraging really, truly interdisciplinary research rather than, um, you know, thinking um, a, a monograph on Proust is a safe prospect. So we'll fund that rather than um, something which draws in, you know, collaboration between, I don't know, French studies and geology or something. <laughs> so yeah, more risk taking, I think. Yeah. Anything from group two? If it is uh, a group we haven't covered. Yeah, Dominique. Yes, Emmanuel, that was so with us. Uh, it was Barbara and, and I, and when we, we um, talked mostly about interdisciplinarity and, and well, we'll echo uh, what, what Martin just said. I think we, we talked about the fact that there is definitely a, a call to be interdisciplinary uh, and that there are definitely also some initiatives taken, but it's that is sometimes difficult uh, to um, to be funded or to find, uh, I was discussing a project that I have to find a publisher when you have an interdisciplinary book, for instance, because it, we're still thinking in disciplinary terms. So it's really I hard. Yeah. yeah, it's really hard to find the fit. Uh, so I think uh, I would really strongly echo Martin. Uh, I think more uh, innovation would be really uh, welcome and, and more, more risk taking. So, so what should be our partner disciplines then? Who should we collaborate with in our new decentered research? Martin? Well, we actually took issue with this because um, <laughs> <laughs> we said, rather, rather bolshily, we said we are the most interdisciplinary of all disciplines. <laughs> um, and yet we suffer from this um, a misconception among people outside of languages. What, what one language is, not just French, is about. They think all we do is translate and look at grammar. Um, so we suffer from, from this kind of simplified understanding of what um, modern languages is generally. But actually, when you look at what we do, we are interdisciplinary. We are, you know, we, we're sort of 
taking bits and pieces and weaving them together. And there's a narrative that holds up again. I think the presentations we listened to this morning really illustrated that. Um, so I think it's actually about sort of um, making other people realize that they need to work with us. That if you're, uh, you know, if you're a global, uh, working on global um, challenges, for example, um, and you're only working with the English speaking world, you're not going to find a global solution. Um, you know, the, we need multilingualism to be built into any kind of global international project. So I don't think it's up to us to change. I think it's everyone else that's, that's, the, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but can we do something to make people understand that basically, well, we should be in all the, uh, the research project because when we are working around language, well, language is also the medium by which any research is done so we should be part of everything so how, how could we make that maybe more more obvious i think i don't know if that's that's not going to answer the question but i think in our group we, we also with this question of which discipline should we collaborate with uh, there was also the question of uh, some discipline as things as, as seems very some interdisciplinary collaboration seems to be very valued, but we worry that we worry a bit that we need a STEM collaboration to justify our utility. Mm. Uh, that or well, not necessarily. I'm simplifying a bit what we're saying, but the idea that we we need to to prove that what we're doing is impactful or useful, uh, we need to collaborate with more STEMy, sciencey type of people, uh, and. As we just said, we're very into this. As you just said, we're very interdisciplinary dis uh, discipline, and we're very useful on our own. We're well, not on our own. It's not against collaboration, but we're also very useful in our research already. In that sense, yeah, there is always a fine line between being like equal partners, and then you know, languages and research around languages being ancillary to those important STEM subjects. Yeah, other things about that did any of the group uh, think about the public engagement part of it and uh, outside academia what could we do better more yeah I mean, we, we talked about this a little bit i mean i think i think it's kind of a, there's a um the the um the challenge is is think i mean I've, you still start with the individual research project um, and it's about thinking about the broad ramifications of that project. You know, the, one of the most difficult research questions is the so what question. You know, why does your research matter beyond your own personal interest in, in, uh, in the subject? But then the, the next question is, you know, and how can you um, galvanize and, and sort of translate the importance of what you do so that it becomes more obviously important and translatable for a, a large number of people? So I think it's sort of just, you know, the impact's already built into to a lot of what we do in, in the UK. Um, so, I mean, I think it's sort of, it, it's about, if we want our research to be more impactful, it is about, you know, be, being part of projects that involve STEM or that not necessarily just STEM, but, you know, are built around big issues like um, public health, um, the environment, and, and making sure that, you know, the projects that are trying to deal with global issues really are global in the sense that they're not just uh, monolingual. Mm. Any other reactions, comments? I'm aware of time now and we should wrap up soon. Anybody for the mot de la fin? <laughs> Well, anyway, if you, you, you feel strongly about those things, you'd like to um, tell us more, feel free to uh, contact either Nicolas, Michel or, or myself. And we would be more than happy uh, to, to talk to you and to relay your, your thoughts. I will just briefly share my screen because I've got um, the, our email address. So feel free to be in touch. We are open for business for the rest of May. Then we will be uh, writing up the report. So uh, feel free to be in touch. And thank you very much for uh, contributing your view to the discussion. Okay, I'm done, Martin. Over to you. Thanks. Okay, well, we've got um, a couple of minutes until the next um, session. Um, 
So um, let's, um, if people want to have a quick break, um, please do. Uh, and then we resume at three o'clock. Um, so thanks, Emmanuel, for that. That was, um, that was really interesting. And, and um, hopefully people had a nice, lively discussion with our group. Thanks. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to um, our um, third um, session of today, uh, which is our second um, workshop um, featuring early career researchers and uh, teachers and a series of um, uh, flash presentations. Welcome to colleagues who are just waking up in the States and joining us. Um, where have you been? Um, <laughs> day's half done. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to hand over to, um, uh, to, uh, I'm looking for, to see if she's here. <laughs> uh, Ashley, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. I'm here, don't worry. <laughs> you said you had your video on. <laughs> I was looking, looking, looking for names. So, um, no, I'm, I'm going here. To Ashley, who's going to chair this session. Um, I'm going to take a back seat, but I will be timing people. Um, and, and their presentation. So um, if you see something in the chat in the middle of your presentation, it could be me saying your 10 minutes are up. So keep an eye out for it. Um, so I'll give you a nod when, when time's up and you need to wrap up. Okay, over to Ashley then. Super, thank you, Martin, and thank you for managing the time element of things as well. Um, thank you all for joining us um, again. This is our final um, panel, the final set of um, papers after already an interesting morning and afternoon. And um, we're moving on to the topic of decentering the learning environment. So we've talked quite a lot about research, and now we're thinking a little bit more about um, the learning environments um, that we create and that we work in. So we've got four um, different interesting and rich sounding papers. Um, we'll have a discussion, um, first of all, uh, on gender inclusive pronouns in French, a social media study of YEL um, with Jula Jean-Boc and Peter Targiani. Um, I'll just do a little bit of an introduction to them and then I'll, I'll pass the floor to them. So um, Jula Jean-Boc is an assistant professor in French and Francophone studies at Middlebury College. He holds a PhD in French linguistics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research centres on language ideologies and authority in French with a focus on France and Quebec. He is interested in the social dynamics of top-down intervention in language use, in particular with respect to borrowings, lexical innovation and inclusive writing. His methodologies include computational and statistical implementations on a variety of textual data, such as social media and newspaper publications. And he will be presenting with Peter, and Peter is a visiting assistant professor of French and Francophone studies at Middlebury College as well, where he also teaches in the Gender and Sexuality Studies programme and the French Language School. 
He holds a PhD in French and Queer Studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research centers on contemporary French and Francophone media culture with a focus on LGBTQ plus representation, building on queer studies and migration scholarship. His work interrogates how sexuality and mobility are bound up in the imaginary of the post-colonial nation state. He's currently completing a book project devoted to the representation of tourism in French and Francophone film, with particular emphasis on North African spaces and identities. So I'll pass over to you both now and thank you very much for starting our our first, our last panel. Thank you so much for the introduction. I just want to double check. Can you all see the screen? We can, thank you. Yes, thank you. Awesome. So, um, hello everyone. Good morning for us. Good afternoon for you all. And welcome to our presentation. And in this paper today, we'll explore how the incorporation of the non-binary pronoun EL in the online edition of Neurobert constitutes new avenues for decentering binary language use. And we aim to analyze how linguistic practices that had been considered peripheral be before transition into the mainstream on social media. So the masculine feminine binary of grammatical gender was not considered the norm in the French language. In October 2021, it was all the more surprising that Le Robert accepted EL as a gender neutral pronoun. An ostensibly lexical and grammatical issue, the official recognition of EL has generated a, public, a heated public debate in France. The notion of inclusive French has been interpreted in various ways over the past five decades. Early inclusive practices aim to grant more representation for women in the workforce, while more recent uh, movements focus on subverting the typographical conventions of the French language and the status quo in the gender binary. In 2017, Atier published a textbook for children where inclusive writing is applied. The medium point, the avoidance of generic masculine, or the feminization of profession names and titles, just to name a few. Following this publication, a polemic exploded in France, bringing up an underlying opposition of language, uh, linguistic change, which in reality targeted the subversion of the already established social order. The backlash surfaced anti-feminist and nationalist sentiments across the political aisles in French, France, which was twofold. First, the conservative position vehemently rejected any perceived influence of American gender theory and advocated for the preservation of the status quo. Second, a position in feminist disguise argued that inclusive writing does not advance feminine causes, but rather hinder them. So these positions are in fact recurring argument, arguments in the 2021 controversy surrounding the inclusion of EL in the online edition of Le Robert. The non-binary pronoun EL is a neologism considered to encompass YIL and EL. Several alternative pronouns have been used by non-binary speakers, but EL remains the one that is universally recognized across various speech communities. In fact, Le Robert added only EL by defining it as a rare pronoun used in inclusive communication in reference to people regardless of their gender. So this talk today presents data from Twitter extracted with the statistical software RStudio. Our corpus consists of over 190,000 publicly available tweets that were posted September, between September and December 2021. On the screen here, you see a couple of examples that we will be discussing in detail. Our analysis was carried out using complex statistical modeling by combining topic models and generalized additive models. Topic models are text mining methods for unsuper unsupervised classification of documents often used in machine learning. A topic could be defined as a mixture of words automatically created by the model, and the researcher is responsible for its interpretation. So, the, so our model was able to distinguish actually five major topics in the corpus that we named controversy, critics, fandom, gender, and general discussion. The majority of the tweets outside of the controversies fall under the, uh, falls under the uh, later three topics. So fandom, gender, and general discussion. But for the sake of today's presentation, we will actually focus on the controversy and critics. Tweets with the highest probability belonging to the controversy topic report on the addition of Yann to Le Robert, often voicing negative sentiments about this innovation. Discourse about identity politics is strongly represented in this topic. 
Users report that Jean-Michel Blanquer repudiated the use of EL in education, while some users actually blame the Castex government for embracing so-called woke ideologies. In fact, terms such as woke, wokeism, or gauchist are distinctively associated with this topic, and they disapprove supposedly American liberal influences in the French society. Examples show that some users go as far as to treat the edition as equivalent to imposition and discourage anyone from using the app. Users repeatedly just oppose Lorbert with Larousse by praising the absence of EL from the latter. Again, the influence of American English is visible since the pronoun is recognized as an awful anglicism. The other topic that we call critics contains tweets where people formulate strong arguments against the use of yet. In this case, however, a recurring theme is not directly related to the dictionary, but rather as a reaction to the state of French society. Proponents of allegedly woke ideologies are ostracized. In response to a poll claiming that 57% of the respondents in France think that France is a predominantly white Christian country, a user declares that for the gauchists, the leftists, France will be, uh, need to become an EL Creole Muslim nation. Others concur with the assumed exclusionary attitudes of EL, Yes, supporters express fear of being labeled as a racist, Catholic, white person for rejecting the pronoun. For some, non-binary gender represents a culture of decadence and extreme narcissism, particularly in the context of discussion about traditional masculinity. These instances clearly exemplify the polarized public discourse that purposefully mixes racial, political, and social stances in the creation of national French identity. So uh, through the prism of the EL controversy, we aim to demonstrate how the reception of North American critical theoretical frameworks such as gender theory and queer theory reveals anxieties not only about non-binary forms of French or inclusive writing, but also the gender, sexual, and racial cohesion of the French nation state. So in the next few minutes remaining, I'd like to talk about how certain aspects of the controversy are framed as new iterations of the looming threat of foreign, specifically US, cultural intrusion on French public opinion and national identity. This fear-mongering about American cultural imperialism is certainly not new. Historian Bruno Perrault has argued that instances of anti-Americanism continue to serve as powerful reminders to the French public, oftentimes across the, across the political spectrum, that there may be an organized effort to sabotage the foundations of French identity. While Perrault documents a wide array of political and media discourses on the French reception of gender theory, in our research, we pay closer attention to the political ramifications of the EL controversy and the ways in which it has to do with the clearing of filiation and filiation's relationship to citizenship. So when EL disrupts heteronormative models of filiation, it also questions the, the stability of French national identity and belonging, as well as the frameworks of normative citizenship. In this sense, filiation is no longer regarded as a simple economic question of inheritance, but as a type of political affiliation intimately tied to immigration. Fares defines citizenship according, according to kinship ties and blood. Immigration can thus be passed on from gen generation to generation, while the word itself is often used as a thinly veiled euphemism for race. This means that filiation is key to preserving the racial unity of the French nation in an age of mass migration and immigration. So you see here on the screen the quote that I'm referring to from Eric Fasson. The French battle about kinship is not simply about the family. It's as much about the nation. Naturalizing filiation or denaturalizing it is not just about heterosexuality or homosexuality. It's equally about Frenchness, that is, about whiteness in post-colonial France. As an illustration of such racial anxieties tied to inclusive language use, 
one needs to look no further than one of the tweets published by the previously mentioned extreme right-wing magazine Valeurs Actuelles, titled provocatively La Langue Française Grand Remplacé, which, of course, evokes the racist conspiracy popularized by people like Renaud Camus, equating non-binary language with the ethnic displacement of France's majority ethnic population, which people like Camus, again, call simply white genocide. So I can talk more about that uh, in the, the Q&A if there are any questions, but for now, uh, for the sake of time, let me offer a brief conclusion um, to our research. Um, so where does this leave us regarding the official status of non-binary pronouns such as yell, and especially the everyday struggles of non-binary people whose lived experiences are so easily disavowed by most politicians and media commentators? So we would like to offer a couple of points for reflection. Number one, inclusive or non-binary pronouns are an integral part of the French language. They are manifestations of authentic language use and innovation, not imported concepts, uh, imported quote-unquote concepts from the United States. Number two, there are growing numbers of people on social media who consistently use pronouns such as yell. By decentering binary heteronormative language and identities, their linguistic practices function as new nexus of identity and community formation. And the last but not least, non-binary pronouns such as yell are essential for the survival strategies of non-binary folks as illustrated by the remark of French linguist and activist Al Ferrats in an interview on France Culture. And this is the quote with which I would like to conclude today. So Al Ferrats says and affirms very positively and proudly, j'existe et je ne suis pas seul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so rich and interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm going to copy our structure from earlier um, and we'll ask if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask now, but there will also be a chance to, to ask more questions at the end of all the sessions. Um, would anyone like to ask the first question? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, thanks very much for a really um, interesting presentation. Just kind of bringing this to the theme of the panel, uh, with the learning environment. I've been teaching about uh, Yale and the controversy around Yale this year, and I wondered how you how you see the kind of growth in its use and the consistency of its use marrying with teaching uh, the language because. There are obviously implications for um, grammar, which we're, we're, we tend to teach in a, in a more standard way. Um, so I wondered what you thought about the development of, of Yale and, and implications for teaching, for language teaching? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this question. That's, a, that's actually very, um, like, it's an essential question. And um, I believe that the addition of Yale to Lourdes was an important first step in the recognition of these uh, non-binary pronouns. At the same time, um, it is not sufficient for non-binary communication because there are many more instances where you would need uh, um, using um, non-binary um, grammatical structures. And there are many available. And I would say that one of the recommendations in the literature is actually to um, introduce these um, available communicative practices to students, and, but also to provide and to guarantee uh, the freedom um, to choose between the available uh, options. Um, and so I think uh, what I've been practicing before is um, really just to introduce it in a, um, a very organic way in presentations, especially like. Um, when we talk about adjectives, and then I use some pictures about like describing uh, certain people, then in that case, naturally, I use uh, EL, for instance, in my example, and then um, some adjectives with it. But the question remains, uh, again, that French is a very gendered language. So 
it is still um, uh, needs to be worked out. Like, what is the preferred adjective agreement? Yeah. And it's and it's really interesting. Just as a follow up on that, and I don't want to take up too much time. But really, there among politicians and media commentators, there is this widespread anxiety. I'm mm -hmm. talking about fans that, oh my God, what is teaching EL in the classroom going to do? to language learners. It's going to yeah. confuse them. They're not apparently smart enough to incorporate that. And that's not we are actually what we are actually seeing yeah. in our classrooms. The, the students are really intrigued and interested in them and by them. And, and then you have you know, non-binary students and then you have to give them the opportunity linguistically and culturally speaking to to, to express themselves mm -hmm. in a foreign language. So it's really, it's really, there is that discrepancy between uh, the politics of these discourses and the actual pedagogical classroom experience, which yeah. is actually start. Thank you for that answer. It was really helpful to, to hear about um, practical examples in your own classes. Um, we are going to pass on for now. We'll come back and I'm sure there'll be time for more questions um, later on. Um, but we're going to pass now to Rachel Wire, um, who will be talking about decentering the hexagon in French language teaching. Um, she is a PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley. Broadly, her work aims to decenter the Northern Metropolitan Standard in French language teaching. Her dissertation is entitled Decentering the Hexagon Towards a Sociolinguistically Informed French Language Curriculum. Um, Rachel, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. And there we go. Um, fantastic. So, um, thank you, everybody, for being here. I know it's the afternoon over there, uh, but here in California, it is bright and early. Um, and I'm so glad to be here today presenting about decentering the hexagon in French language teaching. So I'm going to start my talk with a little anecdote. Um, I teach a class at UC Berkeley that's called Practical Phonetics and Listening Comprehension. And originally, this was the kind of phonetics course that taught students how to sound more French. In more recent years, my colleagues have started to add more and more recognition of the fact that French speakers globally don't all sound the same. Case in point, I often joke around with my students that I am not at all a reliable model for standard French pronunciation. Rather, as a sociolinguist and a second language speaker of French, I'm hyper aware of my own accent cobbled together over the last 15 or so years of learning with teachers from all over the Francophone world. Uh, more specifically, my training in sociolinguistics has left me acutely aware of how my own accent aligns with and diverges from the idealized hexagonal standard. Yet it's this prescriptive standard that continues to be revered in United States university language teaching, which is the context in which I work. Despite our geographic proximity to non-European Francophone communities here in the US, representations of French language and of its speakers tend to remain pretty Eurocentric largely disregarding or worse tokenizing Francophone communities peripheral to the Northern French metropole. And research at the intersection of socio and applied linguistics continues to demonstrate that this uncritical centering of an idealized standard can reinforce stereotypes, it can erase shared identities between L1 and L2 French speakers, and it can further marginalize already underrepresented communities. So I talk to my students a lot about my own accent, not to self-deprecate, but rather to contextualize the speech that they're hearing day in and day out within this vast range of varieties spoken across several continents and known collectively as French. So this is the foundation of my approach to teaching French language. As a graduate student instructor, I've developed this approach primarily in my teaching of the French phonetics course at Berkeley. So in addition to what you would kind of expect, lessons on the phonetic processes that underlie standard French pronunciation, students in the course encounter pronunciation features of a range of global French varieties and reflect on the language ideologies that underpin hierarchies among these varieties. They do this work primarily through a number of listening assignments aimed at highlighting particular features and through short writing assignments about language attitudes in particular communities. But what I believe to be most important about this approach is our framing of the many varieties of French that we encounter. So in this course, we view the standard language 
not as inherently correct or good, but instead as the result of hegemonies that reveal themselves in language planning. And under this framing, students discover how vast and variable the French language can be, but also that all language is inherently variable and that the linguistic and the social are deeply interconnected, both within and beyond the Francophone world. Um, students' response to this approach can be seen, for example, in the range of French speaking communities and sociophonetic phenomena that they choose to treat in their final projects. Um, so, for example, this final project is adapted from the concept of the unessay, and it asks students to integrate at least one sociolinguistic concept or question into some kind of basic phonetic analysis. Uh, and they're given the choice of different digital and physical formats for presenting their work. So I wanted to show you just some of the topics that students from my spring 2021 and 2022 sections uh, that they have taken on. So these include, for example, the effects of standard French education on Haitian French pronunciation, the development of fricative pronunciation among children in central Paris and the banlieue, phonetic features of French in contact with indigenous languages of Senegal, the effects of youth speak and contact with immigrant languages on banlieue accents, regional dialect features in contemporary francophone song, phonetics of loan words in Vietnamese, navigation, uh, navigating pronunciation of gender inclusive endings in French, and our pronunciation by francophones in Pondicherry, India. So Perhaps the most striking thing about this range of topics has been their interest in highlighting communities that may not typically be folded into institutional perceptions of francophonie. For instance, countries colonized by France, but with very few remaining French speakers. Furthermore, um, written responses and formal course evaluations emphasize a newfound appreciation for the linguistic diversity of the French speaking world and a greater awareness of the ways in which dimensions of positionality like race, gender, and class are linked to languaging and to language ideology. So I wanted to show you just a few highlights from their reflections. When asked how their understanding of the French speaking world changed over the course of the semester, several students from my spring 2021 section referenced a better understanding of how French speakers sound in different parts of the world. So one student says, I have learned to appreciate the variety of dialects and pronunciations throughout the Francophone world and to appreciate its richness and diversity. Students also reflected on the ideologies associated with French language teaching. For the sake of space, I've abridged this quote on my slides, but I'm gonna read you the full quote. The student says, I think for a lot of us who study French as a second language, we treat our pronunciation as a measure of our ability and skill with the, with the language. In that way, I think this course was a breath of fresh air in that, of course, while improving one's skills in a language can include improving pronunciation for the sake of clarity and comprehension. There is absolutely nothing anyone should be self-conscious of when speaking French. And likewise, nothing that we should judge others for in their ways of speaking French. I didn't realize how much issues like colonialism and social class were tied into linguistic phenomena, so I'm really glad I was able to broaden my perspective through this class. Finally, students were also aware of a lack of representation of many of these communities in other French courses. A student remarks, the course provided a lot of depth and diverse information on the Francophone world, including uh, but not limited to France. I learned a lot about French speaking countries outside of France, which I think is ignored in other classes. So looking at these student takeaways alongside their projects that center a number of non-French or otherwise marginalized Francophone communities, um, this illustrates for us how visibilizing varieties that are often seen as peripheral can actually expand perceptions about what it means to speak French or what it means to be Francophone. And by decentering France, we create space to better represent speakers whose identities may not be captured by mainstream definitions of francophonie. So this visibilization not only facilitates the development of acute language awareness in the context of L2 acquisition of French, but it also equips students to critically evaluate instances of linguistic stereotyping and discrimination, as well as other forms of language-based oppression that they encounter, whether it's in a French classroom or elsewhere. 
In turn, their critical language awareness has the potential to then mitigate the harmful effects of language-based oppression in their university community, in their own communities, and hopefully beyond. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that is my that is my talk. No, it's really great. Thank you, Rachel, for that. Um, thanks for those interesting reflections. Would anyone like to ask one question before we move on to the next um, the next paper? Not seeing any hands yet. I don't think. Oh yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we were actually talking about that uh, during your presentation that this is um, something very essential that we need actually uh, in phonetics teaching because that is something a challenge that I encountered previously as well. And so because like teaching the standard French, but also exposing and how would you actually avoid because I, I took notes on that like tokenization um, that you brought up at the beginning. So you're not just like showing that there is this variety in addition to the standard and that's it let's move on so how do you how would you just avoid that and to actually like organically introduce it in, in um, a broader context in the class that's a great question thank you for that um so personally i've um introduced a lot of phonetic concepts by showing them different French varieties, rather than just showing them examples in the standard, sometimes I will have them sort of deduce a concept that I'm going to introduce by first hearing a sample of mm -hmm. someone speaking a non-hexagonal French variety. Um, and a lot of our exercises that we did to get them to really understand the phonetic concepts were based in listening to non-French accents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and thanks for that question as well. Um, as I said before, we'll come back. So we're now moving on to Madeleine Wolf. who will be speaking about how and why we speak about the past, blending language and culture in lessons on Francophone North Africa. Madeleine Wolf is a visiting assistant professor of French studies at New York University, Abu Dhabi. She received her PhD in May 2021, so congratulations on that, um, from Harvard University, where she wrote her dissertation on noise in 19th century French literature. In addition to her literary research, Madeleine enjoys teaching French classes that blend language and culture in meaningful ways that, and that broaden conceptions of French and Francophone identity. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, I'm just going to pop a link in the chat in case you prefer to, to read along as I, as I talk. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I'm honored to close out uh, this wonderful event. Thank you to the organizers for making this possible. Um, and I'm really excited to give you all a glimpse of what I do here at NYU Abu Dhabi. As Ashley said, I'm a visiting assistant professor of French studies. I teach um, beginning and advanced language classes as well as um, interdisciplinary humanities seminars in English. But today I'll focus on how I decenter French studies in the classroom, specifically through activities on France's colonial past that embrace students' cultural and linguistic diversity. Teaching French in the Middle East presents certain challenges, of course, but mainly it's an opportunity to reorient and broaden uh, the field of French studies for myself and students. And in this talk today, I'll share how I blend language and culture in my advanced French class that I've titled La Francophonie en Action, um, where students experiment with how and why we speak about the past, specifically France's colonial past in North Africa. I want to stress that students are at the core of my teaching. They help inspire the goals and content of our courses. So first I'll give a very brief background of what it means to teach French to students at NYU AD before sharing examples of how I decenter and recenter French in the French language classroom. Some of you might be surprised to, to learn that the UAE and Abu Dhabi in particular uh, have a strong French presence. There's a Sorbonne campus, a Louvre, French immersion schools, and a growing interest in learning French at NYUAD. Our students are wonderfully diverse. They come from over 120 countries. Most, if not all, speak at least two languages and usually many more. Um, many already have some kind of background in French actually because they come from former French colonies like Senegal, Mauritius, Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, or they've attended Lycée Francais in places like Belgrade or Mexico City. They're tuned into issues related to colonialism, decolonization, 
linguistic and cultural hybridity because this is part of their lived experience, um, even if they don't know how to name these things yet. And they're often more aware of their own Francophone context more than that of the hexagon. So students have already decentered French studies in a way just by virtue of who they are when they step into my classroom. But I don't think students always realize this. I think a lot of them come from places that still idealize Frenchness in certain ways, or where whiteness and the West still have a lot of cultural capital. Um, and they don't necessarily believe that they can bring their own cultures or their own languages and their own knowledge into the classroom. Uh, in fact, teaching here, I really had to confront that a lot or most of my scholarly training and academic research could be seen as participating uh, in the idealization of Frenchness uh, or traditional French culture and patrimony. But in order to decenter French studies for myself and for students, I've taken a lot of inspiration from them, from their backgrounds, their interests, their current context as students in a Middle Eastern country. So now we'll get into what that looks like in the classroom, specifically during our unit where we review the use of les temps du passé. And I chose to take a historical approach in our material um, because I was being cute, because we're talking about le passé, um, but one that still felt relevant to students. So for this unit, let's see, there we go. For this unit, I assign uh, the 2006 Franco-Algerian film Indigène about North African and Senegalese soldiers who fought for France during World War II and who experienced discrimination and unequal pay even through the 21st century. Uh, and I worked closely with my research assistant, Aya Elmir, who is from Morocco, to assign com complimentary readings from Ahmed Sefrouy's 1954 novel, La Boite à Merveille, which is considered to be one of the first Moroccan narratives written in French, and uh, Leila Slimani's Le Pays des Autres that Ayla mentioned earlier. These texts tell different stories of Morocco during the colonial era. Sefrouy's novel is more of a celebration of Moroccan tradition, whereas Slimani presents a very complex look at gender, class, and ethnicity. The materials are in French, of course, with a range of formal and informal, literary and oral registers, but there's obviously a lot of mixing with Arabic vocab and cultural traditions. And that's especially true of Antigen, which um, has a lot of dialogue in Arabic. Through these works, we discover the historical and cultural context of French colonization and life during the colonial era while engaging in brief film and literary analysis as well. Regarding grammar, we use these works to review different tenses of the past, le passé composé, l'imparfait, le plus que parfait, and a little bit of le passé simple. And we start off with very structured exercises where students are prompted to find examples of these tenses in their readings or determine the appropriate tense in a sentence about the materials. Here's um, an example of a little exercise I made for them if you want to look at it. Um, and the goal here is to blend cultural and linguistic content as students learn precisely how we talk about the past, order of events, which tense conveys what significance or replies to what context, etc. And after providing them with this structure and guidance so they understand the how of talking about the past in French, we open it up to a larger in-class discussion to engage with why we should talk about it. And to do this, I worked closely with Aya again. Uh, we designed activities about French colonialism in her home country of Morocco. Aya had previously conducted interviews with her family back in Morocco in English, French, and Moroccan Arabic, Darija, where she asked them how they believed the value of human life had changed over time. And in these interviews, she spoke with her grandmother, who speaks Arabic and experienced French colonial rule and injustices firsthand, her parents, who speak French and Arabic and who are the first generation after Moroccan independence, and her younger sister, who mainly speaks French but is learning English. She presented excerpts of these interviews in French, English, and Darija to students and led a phenomenal in-class discussion about the effects and damage of French rule. Uh, which she said was rarely spoken about in Moroccan schools. This encouraged other students to talk about their own experiences of linguistic and cultural hybridization in their home countries like Serbia, Macedonia, Slovenia, Kazakhstan. Um, and these were experiences towards which students felt a lot of ambivalence. Most of this conversation was in French, but we occasionally shifted into English or even a little bit of Arabic as we watched Aya's interview with her grandmother or when, when students referred back to Andijen. And I know that some, some language teachers might not like this. Uh, they might bristle at the idea of using uh, languages and contexts that are not French or Francophone, um, especially when the advanced students are capable of having this conversation in French. Um, but I feel strongly that this conversation wouldn't have been the same. Um, and in a way, I think it would have perpetu perpetuated the colonial linguistic norm that Aya had just told us about. 
besides switching between languages and context was actually truer to the reality of the Maghreb region that we were studying, which has blended dialects of Arabic, French, Spanish, and English for years. And it's also uh, more true to the lives of students who switch between languages, codes, and registers constantly every day. Just as we recentered French history, a subject of critique when we talk about France's colonial legacy, we also recenter the French language itself to understand the weight it carries for people like Aya and her family who are made to learn the colonizer's language. The linguistic goals of learning the past tense are never abandoned, even if they temporarily take a back seat. Um, instead, the linguistic component, I think, can be strengthened by these freer discussions because students see a reason and a use for it um, without it seeming like grammar, grammar and conjugations are the only thing that we do in French class, like Martin was saying. Um, after class, two of my students said that our discussion with Aya was one of the best classes they'd had at NYUAD in French or in general. Obviously, I was super thrilled to hear that. Um, I just wish I could take more credit because I think that by working closely with students like Aya, um, taking an interest in where your students are coming from, holistically speaking, this is, all, this is almost always going to lead to a better class. Uh, so to conclude, I'll list some takeaways that I found helpful for my research and teaching and which I hope might be useful to others. First, as I've said uh, a few times now, let's see if I can, uh, the experience reinforced the importance of leading with a student-centered approach and that taking into account students' identities engages all of us more and promotes a more enriching classroom experience. Second, it taught me that speaking in and about languages and cultures other than French isn't something to avoid. Instead, we should embrace it in meaningful ways that can actually nourish student learning of the target language and the material at hand. And finally, um, developing content-based language courses like this one allows me to bridge the perceived gap between language and content. And I've also realized that teaching language classes can be beneficial to my literary research, especially as I've learned to feel less bound by national, cultural, and cultural divisions. For example, I started working on a project on sound and sound and colonial discourse that juxtaposes Flaubert with Asia Jebach, uh, and a lot of that was inspired directly from this class and working with Aya. So decentering French studies isn't just beneficial for students, it's also helped me expand and develop my research. Um, I think that wraps up my time, so if you have feedback or questions, I'd love to, to hear them and to speak more with you. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time and attention and, and for such a wonderful event today. Thank you so much, Madeline. That was great. Um, I'm very much realizing how lucky all of your different students are, each of the presenters. You're obviously putting in a lot of effort in, in what you do with your students. And I'm sure that's, and it sounds like it's highly appreciated by the different groups that you teach. So well done for that. Um, we will take a question from Madeline specifically because she's just presented her paper. Um, who'd like to ask Madeline a question before we open up to more general questions to anyone? Adeline, I'd like to ask you, this is maybe a slightly unfair question. Oh, and then I'll pass to you, Dominique, as well, in just a second. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the time that goes into preparing classes. That class looked amazing, but I would wonder if the pressure was to, you know, how much time must have gone into that. And it's partly to say it's amazing how much you put into it. But I'm also wondering, you know, do, do you think that that is a way that we could do language teaching more broadly? And would, would there be a challenge in terms of time um, with it or is it something we should be doing sometimes or I guess I'd, I'd love to see how that fits in with with your teaching more broadly. Um, yeah thank you for that question that is uh, very important especially as an early career scholar um, and I'm the only French teacher at this university I'm the only person that works in French at all here so um, yeah it's been a lot of work but I do think that like working closely with students you can delegate uh, in ways that are mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, so like Aya was really passionate about, about Moroccan history. And so she kind of, you know, I kind of oversaw it, but she, she took a lot of initiative on her own. That said, yeah, it takes a lot of time. Um, but I think it is something that we should be doing at least sometimes because mm -hmm. if not, like, what is it that we're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you're able to tap into your own interests and your students' interests, then it, it all it all kind of feeds feeds itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, it does. It sounds like the students reacted in the best way that you could have hoped for. Yeah, so that, no. yeah, yeah, you got the fruit of the labor at least. That's good. That's true. Um, go ahead, Dominique. I'll pass over to you. Now. 
Thanks, Ashley, and thank you all for, for your presentations. It was really um, wonderful to hear about your work. So uh, my question is a little bit for, for everyone. Um, Madeleine, you, you showed um, an example of an exercise you developed, which, which blends uh, very well um, language and culture. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, students' response to that exercise, like how did they fare with both the, the language and uh, writing about such a, a complex um, issue. Uh, but also to, to other panelists, uh, Alexandre, you talked about introducing music, which is um, very new uh, in our department, I'm at Durham as well. So how do you um, assess that? Assess that? Can you give us an example of um, how this works for essay writing or class activities? Uh, and similarly about inclusive language, um, I'm, I'm trying to introduce it. I teach French language and uh, I think Daniel's question earlier uh, pointed at the difficulty of that. So uh, how do you uh, assess um, writing inclusively uh, in your classes for, for the teachers who've uh, introduced that. So sorry, a lot of questions, but uh, uh, if, if you could share your thoughts, please. I mean, I, I can start by responding um, how students, you know, receive the, the exercises. They receive it really well. I think a lot of them are really fed up with, you know, they come from high school where it was a lot of rote language uh, memorization and these very boring exercises where the meaning is completely divorced from anything that would be useful. So I, I think students receive it really well. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions obviously about le passé composé, l'imparfait, you know, all the things that you might expect when to use what. Um, but those are, I mean, I think using the language in that sense where there, there's room for more questions, but that's just because like, you know, we've all kind of said today, language is subjective. Um, we use it in different ways. So I think overall it, it, it's well received um, and students really want to write about these topics. They want to they want to talk about it. Um, they're really hungry for it, I think. Um, no, it's okay, I'm not mute. Uh, and as for me, like the assessment, well, this is precisely why I chose songs with text, you know, like I'm not going to make them listen to like three hours of choral music and to expect them to come up with some sort of like analysis. Um, but also to trust their own instincts as well. I mean, like this is a medium like another. And if they, you know, of course, I introduced them to se several patterns such as, you know, call and response melodies and patterns, polyrhythm, etc. But also what is it that you're listening to and what does it produce, you know, in light of the lyrics as well? And I think some students were a little bit taken aback in the first place. But when I told them, like, look, you know, it's just like, it's the same thing as reading poetry. Like, what is it that you feel and how do you understand that rhyming pattern or not, you know? Um, and I think, like, they, they, they really showed enthusiasm in that. And it was also new as well. So it was, like, interesting to hear like some really good stuff in the first seminar saying like okay you know I, I really do understand this decrescendo as you know a, a sort of like you know uh, drumming the revolution or something like this which I thought was really interesting to, to give them as Madeline said as well to give them a little bit more uh, independence can produce like amazing analysis as well yeah So I would like to actually um, um, respond to your, your question about the inclusive language as well. And so I think it depends on the, uh, the classes, because my experience is that um, basically as a, the example that I mentioned before, when using like introducing adjectives and then talking about people, and then in that case, we can introduce uh, um, um, more inclusive pronouns, that is uh, one approach and that can be on an um, um, you know, introductory or beginner level French as well, French classes. However, um, I all, also like to target uh, and tackle the, the question of this social anxiety that we were talking about in a more advanced class. So, for instance, when we talk about like sociolinguistics or language ideologies in a 200 or 300 level class, then in that case, like I, I really, I, I'm not focusing on the production itself, but more on how they perceive all this discourse and what can they uh, extract from Twitter, from the academy. So this is more like a broader discussion. And 
Um, we always talk about um, the exposition to this before, and uh, usually uh, they have none. So this is a brand new information for them. So I think that's why uh, this whole conversation about in the past couple of years in France and uh, in the Francophonie as well, uh, about this question of like inclusive writing, uh, that was super important. However, I'd, I'd like to also uh, note that our discussion for today, like it focused on the uh, non-binary pronoun, but inclusive French itself is, uh, especially with the typographical modifications, that is um, very um, debated as well in French. And uh, some students reflect on that, that in some papers when they submitted something with the uh, medium point or anything like that, they were graded harshly for that. So um, that's, that's again like, um, we would need to be careful about teaching these because we are also teaching um, things that have social connotations in France and in French culture. So it is, it is a double-edged sword. It is. And I just wanted to add just very briefly that there is some internal debate about these questions. I would say even here, I'm saying this almost silently here at Middlebury <laughs> as well, because, you know, I'm talking about, for instance, the French language schools over the summer, which attract a lot of, I mean, hundreds of people from all parts of the world, mainly the United States. And then, you know, there are some instructors who have very strong feelings in favor of inclusive writing and others who have usually not so strong, but, you know, sometimes some hesitance or, or, yeah. or reticence when it comes to incorporating these forms. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why it's important to teach also the uh, uh, social meaning of these, these um, available tools. But thank you so much, everyone, for your answers. Thank you. Does anyone else have another question? We have a little bit of time left. Okay, I actually, I wouldn't mind asking. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the motivations for the choices that you've all made. I mean, was this more student led that led you to do these or was it more personal interest or um, was it research led even? Um, what was the kind of original motivation for, for doing this in each of your, your work? So that's a question really to everyone. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about motivations behind this pedagogy. I'll go first. I'll be really quick. I think uh, it's primarily drawn from personal interest, but also coupled with the need, perhaps, to introduce students to other media, media as well. You know, like we often engage with texts and films. Why don't we engage with music, essentially, mm -hmm. especially when it is something that can foster so much collaboration, community, etc. So yeah, when I was given the opportunity to teach on that module, I think it was like quite clear that, you know, I remember like actually I was asked to come up with like a new uh, presentation for the interview. And uh, I was thinking of, you know, doing the same old, you know, Jebar or Saint Ben, et cetera. And then at some point it was just like, well, I've got this passion for West African music, why don't I just enjoy, uh, engage with that and couple mm. this with the idea of nation building. And he actually like works quite well. So. Um, mm yeah that's great have anyone else similar experiences or different experiences from that yeah i mean for me personally it was definitely my own research um kind of that i started doing kind of at the same time that i started teaching and sort of realized whoa okay this curriculum is really standard focused um and so it kind of felt like i had to start bringing things up because it mm -hmm. just felt like i had all this information that students didn't really necessarily have any idea about. Um, and then those that did were often dealing with, you know, things like linguistic insecurity, or they had, you know, they had like internalized these, uh, these ideologies. And so, yeah, it kind of just felt like a need <laughs> to, to kind of open up their world a little bit. Um, because it's certainly not how I was taught French. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, I would echo what Alexandra and Rachel both said about um, a little bit of personal interest, but and 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 kind of uh, serendipity of meeting students here, which is very easy to do because they're all they're all so great. Um, and and then also like personally wanting to, um, yeah, like seeing the films maybe that students had associated with Frenchness or mm -hmm. or you know like their kind of ideas about. I don't know the things that they consider to be like francophone culture, like the culture that they were consuming. Like I, in, in a previous class, we had they had watched Indochine with Catherine Deneuve, which you know is a fine movie, whatever. But it seemed like a little bit. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want you guys to watch that. I want, I want to, you know, give you something better. So, um, and then meanwhile, you get to learn from them too. So, kind of all, all of those things. Yeah. Anything else to add? Um... Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add that this is this is really uh, for us as well, like student motivated as well, because of course, like they need representation and they are looking for that representation, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in a gendered language like French, uh, but also research motivated. So it's really uh, um, from both sides. Yeah, for us. Yeah, that's great. Well, it does sound like it's really benefited your students and is taking um, French in new directions, which was really the theme of today um, today's um, work as well, which is perfect. Um, I think we've actually come towards the end of our time, so I'll maybe pass over um, back over to you, Martin, if you'd like to give your concluding remarks. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's, it says on the program um, concluding remarks. Um, I think I'm just going to say thank you. Uh, my concluding remarks, everybody who's contributed today, it's been absolutely fantastic. And um, you know, I think I think um, as the the two uh, panels of, of early career presentations have been absolutely brilliant. Um, it, it's really interesting to see what work is going on there, not just in terms of research, but in terms of pedagogy as well. Um, and and to, it gives a really good sense of the, the, the vitality of the discipline, uh, as well as the diversity of it, and, and the, the way in which we're um, alive as a discipline to, to a range of issues and how this is being translated um, in, into the work that we do, uh, and also to see the way that's being appreciated by students as well. So, uh, so yeah, so just to say thank you to uh, all our presenters today, but also to say thank you to um, colleagues who've chaired um, panels. Um, so um, uh, Rebecca, uh, who did this morning, Ashley, who's just done this session, Akame, who did the uh, uh, the the uh, plenary session and then Emmanuel who, who led the, the session just before this one as well so so thank you everybody um we've recorded um everything today including the lunch break I realized um <laughs> so I got a bit of editing to do um but um uh, we'll be we'll be in contact to uh, anybody presented to get your permission to to use your recording you don't have to let us have your permission we'll edit you out um along with the lunch break if, um, if you're not happy. Uh, so we'll be in contact again in the next few days with, with the mission forms for you. And then what we do is we'll, we'll upload the recording uh, to, uh, to YouTube once we have all the permissions in. Um, and, and then people who weren't able to attend today will benefit from, um, from your wisdom. So, so thanks once again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your morning, stroke afternoon, stroke evening, wherever you are in the world. And thanks for coming along today. Thank you. Bye.